Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. Pisgah National Forest is a place where this happened. Being a park ranger in this breathtaking wilderness was a dream come true for me. I'm Emily, a diligent and dedicated protector of nature. I love this job, wildlife and clean air that cannot be found elsewhere. Anyway, one day I had received reports of unruly visitors, led by a notorious troublemaker named Jake, causing havoc and disregarding the park's rules. It was my duty to confront them and ensure the safety of the wildlife they were threatening. They basically scared animals and threw rocks at them. So I approached the group, making my presence known. Excuse me, I called out, trying to maintain my composure. You are violating park regulations, and I'll have to ask you to stop. Jake, a smug smirk on his face, turned to face me. Oh, look who it is, he sneered. The park ranger with no power. What are you going to do? Write us a ticket. I took a deep breath, trying to keep my temper in check. If you continue this behavior, I will have no choice but to remove you from the park. Respect the rules and the wildlife or face the consequences. Laughter erupted from Jake's group as they mocked my authority. With a defiant whoop, they sprinted into the depths of the woods, disappearing from sight. I shook my head in frustration, knowing I couldn't let them get away with their reckless actions. So the next day, a chilling phone call shattered the tranquility of my morning. A murder had occurred within the National Forest, and it was in the same area where Jake and his friends had fled. Arriving at the crime scene, a shiver ran down my spine. The sight before me was like one in slasher horror movies. The bodies of Jake and his friends lay sprawled across the forest floor, lifeless and mangled. Horror washed over me as I examined the claw marks deeply etched into their flesh. These marks were like nothing I had ever seen before, resembling the powerful imprints of an enormous bird of prey, but larger, much larger. As I stood there, a chilling realization began to take shape in my mind. Could it be possible that they had fallen victim to a cryptid? a creature akin to the Bigfoot or the terrifying Dogman. The thought sent shivers down my spine. We waited for police to come, and as we were waiting, I analyzed bodies. Those marks were too deep to be of animal or human origin. This was something else. Also, one thing was also suspicious to me. Instead of police, five men in black came and threatened us to leave the crime scene and not spoke of the murders again. Why? I wonder. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to come forward with this story, seeing that the recent events in Japan are still fresh in everyone's memory. I have been a follower of your podcast. Naturally, your podcast was the one I thought of first when this incident happened, and I decided to write in and tell you what happened that night in early February. I was in Japan on business and had emailed a lifelong friend who was living in Japan and teaching English at a local school. He had insisted on my staying with him for the duration of my stay, saying it would help save me money and make my expense report look better when I turned it in. My friend I will call him Tim for the sake of his reputation and career was a lifelong bachelor and had a fairly large apartment all to himself and his cat. After several days of day-long meetings and group seminars, we decided to go out to get a bite to eat and take in the town. After a fairly large meal and hopping from one night spot to another, we decided to go toward the ocean and check out the moonlight reflecting off the waves. My friend stated that he wanted to check on a biology station that some of his graduate students had set up near a large power plant. As we approached the plant from the west, we walked along some paths and came to a simple metal box bolted into the ground. From this box, there were a myriad of weather vanes and other meteorological devices. My friend stated the school science class students had a theory that just like the water being used and discharged by the power plant was warmed by the production of electricity, the air around the plant was also being warmed and thus affecting weather and tidal patterns in the surrounding ecosystem. 
It all sounded too complex, and in my slightly tipsy and tired state, was only able to grasp the bare bones of the complex theory he laid out. He finished up and changed the subject to something more jovial when all of a sudden we heard a loud and distinct whoosh. At first, my mind thought it might be the sound of the distant waves crashing ashore when we heard it again, followed by an ear-pitching screech that shook me down to the bone and made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. We looked around for the cause of the noise when we heard the sound again. The best way I can describe it is a city bus break when they are in need of service, loud and ear-splitting. We both continued to look around when my friend's attention was drawn toward the plant by another nearby couple. A younger couple, out for a walk, were staring toward the plant, arms outstretched and the obvious fear in their voice showing itself. I looked toward the plant, and against the lights of the plant, I thought I saw a figure silhouetted against the moonlit sky. The figure was large and black. From the distance I was at it looked to be sitting on top of one of the squared-shaped buildings. It sat there for about five seconds, then it unfurled a large set of what I could only describe as large black wings. The only reference I can compare them to is from the old John Travolta movie Michael, where the main character unfurls his wings and spreads them out to their full length. To say that this creature was large was an understatement. The creature then took flight and circled the plant at least four or five times. Some circuits he took at a fast pace, some he seemed to slow down, all the while he kept his attention on the row of square-shaped buildings that I later found out housed the reactors. The creature then came toward us, flying at least 25-30 feet off the ground. The younger couple who had noticed the creature first were now screaming and cowering, the man shielding the woman while shielding his head with a jacket. My friend and I looked in awe as this creature flew over us. That's when I noticed the two large red eyes. They seemed to glow from within and with a blood red hue. They were unblinking in the three, four seconds we saw them. We knew they were looking straight at us. We knew this creature knew we could see it, and it made no attempt to disguise itself. The sick, intense, and overwhelming feeling of dread came over us. A feeling that we shouldn't be there was, to say the least, overwhelming. As quickly as it came, it flew away, back toward the town, eventually melting into the black night sky, and as it flew away from us, a loud whoosh was heard again, and then... Silence. This lasted a second or two before I heard the sound of a shudder, and turned to see my friend trying to take pictures with his cell phone, but all he got was a dark nighttime sky. We went straight home and my friend bolted the door and drew all the blinds. He was shaking and saying that he could not believe what he saw. Could it have been a large, unknown species of bird? He kept mumbling to himself until I was able to calm him down and get him to relax and talk about what we had seen. Eventually, we both agreed that it must have been some sort of large bird, or maybe an optical illusion caused by the lights given off by the plant on a regular, known species of bird. We talked about it late into the night, till we both fell asleep on the couches and awoke the next morning to stiff necks and backs. My friend and I spent the last two days out and about and enjoying each other's company, till he drove me to the airport and we bid each other farewell and I came home. We spoke about it only once more in an email about a week before he was due to come to the U.S. for his sister's wedding. When I brought it up at the wedding rehearsal dinner, he was convinced that it had been an optical illusion. That was until the day before the wedding when he woke me out of a deep sleep with a frantic phone call telling me to turn on the TV. There came the images of the devastation of the Japanese earthquake and the near total destruction of the city of the town of Okuma, where my friend was living and working. On the day of the wedding, the news came of the explosions at the local nuclear power plant and a CNN broadcast the report we were both aghast at the same power plant where we had seen the strange bird-like object not being shown on the television set. The Fukushima Daiichi was the exact same plant we had seen the strange bird-like creature circling. Was it pure coincidence, or was it the mythical Mothman doing his strange work of predicting disasters? I may never know and may go to the grave wondering that, but one thing is certain for sure. I don't think that either of us is going to forget this event no matter how long we live.
I'm kind of an avid amateur photographer, and one night around 4 a.m. I was out alone in the Firehole Basin region of the park. The goal was to take a long exposure photo of a geyser erupting, with the Milky Way stretching through the sky overhead. The photo turned out to be pretty much a bust. When geysers erupt, they blow massive amounts of steam into the air, and steam kind of blurs that whole beautiful night sky situation. But anyway, I parked my car and hiked a ways to get close to the geyser I wanted to photograph. Then I set up my tripod, adjusted all the settings, and waited for the eventual eruption. The night was crystal clear, perfectly quiet, and very cold. As my ears grew accustomed to the lack of sound, I gradually realized I could hear the gentle burbling of the spring that gives birth to the Firehole River, some distance behind me. I could hear wind in the trees and leaves rustling across the ground. In front of me, I could hear rumbling and hissing from deep within the earth, as the white dome geyser worked itself up for another inevitable eruption. An owl hooted somewhere above me, and I could even hear the distant howls of wolves across the bowl of the Midway Valley below. As my eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, I could see the Milky Way stretched like a river of light from horizon to horizon overhead. A million billion stars shined above, brilliant and cold. Orion hung over my right shoulder, and Venus burned just above the horizon so bright it almost hurt to look directly at it. And then behind me, loud and sudden, the pounding footsteps of a giant, clearly coming right at me. Bear, Bigfoot, some hideous monster, born in the hell of a geyser's boiling mouth, spewed upon the land to wreak vengeance. I didn't know, but I knew it was coming, and I knew it was close. The buffalo actually brushed against me as he went past. I was frozen in place, resigned to my fate. A huge bull, a mountain of fur and horns, shambling up out of the darkness, steam billowing from his nostrils in the cold, dry air. It felt like a close encounter with a freight train. He strode past like I didn't exist, seemed to tiptoe gently around my tripod, then stopped about ten feet in front of me and took a long, slow, very satisfying, steaming piss on the ground. Then he grunted and went on his way, and I stood there wondering how I was going to take a photo if the geyser blew before my hands stopped shaking. My encounter occurred in Golconda, Illinois on June 15, 1991 at approximately 2.30 a.m. That night I thought I dreamed about several aliens coming into a cabin I was staying in with my girlfriend. Early the following morning I awoke and described to my girlfriend my strange dream. She went on to tell me that she had the same dream and that she had been taken to a spacecraft out in the field that was near the cabin. In my dream, I was awoken by three five alien greys. Their featureless faces were only illuminated by the reflections from their black eyes. I remember sitting up in bed, holding the covers up to my face so that only my eyes were exposed. They came towards me, and one seemed to be holding some strange, jewel-encrusted wand. It was gold and had red and green crystals that may have been used to control the device. I think it was this device that was used by the aliens to disrupt my memory of the events. The next evening my girlfriend woke me up very late at night, terrified. She said they were back, and she did not want to do with them. Immediately I became aware of a very low frequency humming that was coming from somewhere outside. Here is where it gets strange since it was a waking memory, and I remember it as a waking memory. My actions at that point on seemed bizarre and irrational to me. I went out onto the porch to see if there was anything. There was a very bright light shining through the trees that separated the space around the cabin from a large overgrown field. It was at this point I think the aliens again used their minds or my own brain was just going into shock over seeing such a bright light shining from this isolated field. We were miles and miles from anything. The cabin we were in had no electricity and no water, and the closest neighbor was several miles down a dirt road. It was like my rational mind kicked in to convince me that what I was seeing was not real. I thought it could be some kids on a TVS, or we were hearing the sound of a faraway generator, or that someone was simply playing a joke on us. From that point on I can't remember much. 
I don't remember going back to the cabin. The next day I woke up early in the morning and went out to the field to see if there was anything. Out where the bright light seemed to be emitted from there were eight concentric circles pressed into the grass and mud. These were not like crop circles but appeared as if something had pressed into the ground. The outer circle was approximately 40 feet in diameter. This incident occurred on Wednesday 20, April 2016 at approximately 8.30 p.m. in Zygi, Cyprus. My two friends and I had just finished our meal and were out in the garden talking and drinking, not alcohol. One of my friends had gone into the kitchen to refill their glass, whilst I and my other friend remained outside. After a moment of silence, my friend pointed out an unusually bright star moving across the sky, assuming it may have been a comet or something. After a brief moment, I looked up at it again to realize that it was stationary, around 75-100 feet above the tree line. I sat there, staring at this thing, just in complete shock. Every 15 seconds or so it would lower its altitude until it was only a couple of feet from the treetops. The weirdest part about this is that absolutely no noise had been emitted thus far. I tried to get out of my chair to hurry inside, but I felt an overwhelming feeling of paralysis, as did my friend. I turned to her and asked her what was going on, but she looked frozen in fear. After what felt like hours, something appeared from around the trees underneath the triangular craft. It was a humanoid figure, with a head similar to that of an ant, and skin like a crocodile. It had extremely small eyes in proportion to its head, and long, thin appendages. It walked right up to the fence before sharply turning and sprinting into the darkness of the trees. After a brief moment of complete fear, dread, and anxiousness, the craft moved in a linear path towards the west before becoming no longer visible. During this time, my friend who had gone to refill her glass watched the entire event through the window. She recalls, although neither me or my other friend do, that the creature had some sort of device in its hand and that it held it up briefly before its disappearance. I do not know why it came to us or to where we were, but I can tell you it is the first time I've ever witnessed this or heard of this happening in Cyprus. I lived in Bose, Alabama at the time of this incident. It was July 5, 2014 at 10.25 p.m. I checked my watch. My friend and I were sitting on her deck drinking coffee. She said, Look, I looked up in time to see a rectangular shaped object with lights circling around it, changing colors. We kept saying, What is that? It briefly went totally dark and then reappeared moving toward her property. Her house is situated at an elevation of 1053 feet above sea level according to my phone. There is a very steep drop off at the edge of her lawn, which is heavily wooded all the way down the mountain. These objects were high above the trees, which are very tall. As the large object moved closer and closer to us, a small semicircular shaped object was seen below the larger object. I grabbed my cell phone and began taking photos of what we were seeing. It came close enough to her lawn to reflect light onto the grass. Then the semicircular shaped object straightened itself out and flew at a speed. I've never seen anything move without of our sight behind trees. The large object began getting very bright with almost fiery looking lights shooting out of the ring where the multicolored lights were first observed. We watched it for what seemed like a short period of time, but we later realized we had been out there watching for about an hour and a half. I have no direct memory of the object leaving or blinking out but it was just gone. I began to take photos all around in hopes of finding where it went. That's when I got the very poor photo of what seemed to be two little creatures. Also, strangely enough, another glowing light appeared deep down in the woods. It would brighten when we talked to it, then dim and brighten again on request. My camera never recorded a photo of this object, although I snapped them repeatedly. My friend said once during watching the object she was going to get a flashlight and go out there and look more closely. I strongly encouraged her not to do that. I felt that we were fine on the deck where we were, but didn't need to be out there any closer. 
We were unnaturally calm afterward and even talked about how we just sauntered back inside the house and went to bed too calm if you ask me. It was a very odd experience. About a year ago I was talking a walk at a local nature park. It's rather big, right alongside a big inlet river. I tend to cycle up there as there is plenty of drops and jumps for me to do on my mountain bike. But this one day, night was a bit weird. You know when you can just feel something in the air? I was going about my business as usual and realized it was getting pretty late. Like not dark, but the light was beginning to fade. Not many people were there that day, but all day I just felt like I was being watched. I lined up a drop which runs next to a set of stairs, quite a long one. Right as I hit the drop I hear this almighty squark. Really throaty. Bit of a roar combined with like, a bird I guess. My handlebars wobbled a little bit. But I managed to get to the bottom without falling. I slam on my brakes and look up the drop behind me. And there was this figure, human-like just standing at the top. He was wearing denim jeans with this weird, almost pagan-esque robe. Garment which had like feathers on it. All tattered and stuff. And he just looked at me, deadpan, no expression, and after about ten seconds just let out this noise again, really loud, eyes stretched out I shit my pants and began to cycle out. Now it's about a ten minute ride of windy paths, going over little wooden bridges covering small rivers runs. I swear to god this noise happens like four more times, each a little closer and to top it off, there was nobody around like normally you get couples walking through or older folk with their dogs, but nobody nothing. I've been back twice since, and each time I just cannot get comfortable enough to stick around and enjoy myself like I used to. One day I think I'll grab a bunch of my pals from hockey and go exploring, see if we can figure that shit out. As a US Air Force law enforcement specialist, I had earned leadership and respect by doing what I'm told to do, no matter how difficult the task. At the time I was stationed at Barksdale AFB in Louisiana. A drugged up civilian man attempted to beat me to death. He was charged and pleaded guilty to the attempted murder of a federal officer. I had been shot at several times by gang members who thought that they could send their buddies on base to sell dope and mess with the enlisted men. I had been recruited into nuclear weapon security and presidential security. These are just a few of my duties while I served. In January 2002, early in the morning around 2 a.m., I entered a conventional weapon storage area on Barksdale AFB. The CAS area was located away from the main area of the base carved out of heavy forest. Inside the CAS area are bunkers. The bunkers have large locks on the doors that are easy to see using a spotlight from a vehicle. I enjoyed doing the CAS checks because it was often peaceful. But on this particular night, I had a gut feeling something was wrong. I called dispatch and informed them that I was doing a CAS area check. Dispatch understood I would be in the area for approximately 20 minutes. The check ended up taking much longer because the weather went from misting to heavy fog and mist limiting my visibility to about 50 yards. With the spotlight, I crept through the sea as area to check bunkers. I became more and more scared, a fear that was new to me. I had never experienced this before. I felt almost a desperate need to leave the area, however. I wasn't finished with my area inspection. So I stopped my vehicle, got out, chambered around in my M4 rifle, and ensured I had an M9 sidearm ready. After re-entering the vehicle, I continued my inspection. As I cleared the older bunkers, I entered a new bunker area. The fear I felt was thick in the air, and I had a fight against that gut feeling that I needed to leave the area quickly. As I approached the newer bunkers, I slowed down and had to pull up very close to them because of the heavy fog and mist. I turned on my spotlight and was shocked to see a row of bunker doors open haphazardly and the padlocks cut off and laying on the ground. I immediately called dispatch and informed them that I needed backup and I had found an unsecured area. Dispatch acknowledged and informed me they did not have a unit to back me up and I should clear the area alone. 
Everything I was informed to do was so far out of the normal procedures that I knew dispatch was dealing with a much bigger issue. I put the vehicle in park and grabbed my M4 rifle and slipped the safety off. I took out the flashlight and looked into the bunkers that had been cut open to find all of them completely empty. I called dispatch and informed them that I was going to return to the main base, and they acknowledged. I got back into my vehicle. The inspection was complete, and I drove up to the lock gate to exit the area. As I exited the vehicle, I again had this absolute terror wash over me, to the point that I looked around into the darkness. I even called out asking if there was someone there. Nothing but complete silence. To make a long story short, the gate was stuck. I was unable to open it. The evil feeling became incredibly strong now. I could feel a presence standing behind me. It was full of hate. I became increasingly aware of this invisible entity or creature. I stopped and turned towards the area. I could feel this thing was near me and I asked it politely to allow me to leave. I turned back and the gate was free to open. I drove my vehicle through locked the gate from inside and walked about 20 feet to a pedestrian gate and attempted to unlock it to leave the area. I couldn't unlock it. I felt this entity almost pressing against me emitting an overwhelming fear within me. I once again turned towards this entity and asked if I could please leave. I turned back to the gate and it was easily unlocked. I exited the gate and turned around locking it shut. I had this distinct feeling that this entity was not able to leave the CA's area and I was safe from it. But it felt as if it was projecting hate and intense fear at me. I cleared the round out of my M4 and put the weapon back into the truck. I returned to my normal duties but soon realized that several hours had passed while conducting my 20-minute inspection. It was now around 7 a.m. I returned to the main base, turned in my weapons, and went to the flight chief's office to explain why I was late returning. I knocked on the door and pushed the door open to see the day shift flight chief sitting behind the desk. When he recognized me, he stood up and said in a very aggressive manner, Did you see it? I was thinking that the NCO was talking about the open bunkers. I said, Yes, sir. He came closer in an aggressive manner and again asked if I'd seen the creature. I was taken aback and said, no, but I felt it. He looked me in the eye and told me never to go into the CA's area alone, and if I was ordered to, which was common, to discreetly inform dispatch, I can't enter that area alone because I was given a lawful order not to. Strangely, I was never assigned to the CAS area again. After many years, I still have no idea what I encountered that night. I was in Kananaskis, a majestic area of the Alberta Rockies known for large mountains and splendor. A friend and I street hiking in early autumn on a trail called the Little Elbow Tombstone Loop. That's the setting, a sunny autumn day in what is basically paradise. We were between Romulus and Tombstone campsites when we decided to stop and get high before continuing on. We stopped and hiked up a cliff a bit and smoked our joint then headed back down to find some tracks in the mud of a river bank. They looked fairly old and we both agreed they were probably wolf tracks because of the amount and size. We kept our bear spray a bit handier, smoked more weed and then carried on. We stopped to smoke a cigarette and eat some candy a half hour later at a river bank and again wolf tracks, but this time fresh and this time going the opposite way. We are now a bit wary, but decide to smoke more weed. We both have our hatchets in hand now. Next stream, and we see the tracks going the opposite direction again. We decide the wolves have been zigzagging behind and in front of us and watching us pass from the hills around the river and are anticipating our continuing down this trail. This is day two, and we will be sleeping in a campsite, and there's nothing we can do about that. We decide to alternate three-hour watches overnight. But on the first watch, my friend wakes me up and says to stay up. There are three wolves across the river from our site rolling around in the grass and playing while occasionally looking our way. We are alone, the sun is setting, and a pack of wolves are watching us. 
We made spears out of aspen saplings and sat by the fire listening to them howl and chatter from about 100 meters away the entire night. They would fight and start snarling, which was not intimidating at all. At about 5 a.m. they went silent and we got ready for them to attack, back to back with bear spray in one hand each, wet t-shirts over our mouths and spears in the other hand. I've heard wolves hunt at sunrise and sunset, so we figured before dawn we'd have to defend ourselves. The first wolf appeared east of us with the sun rising behind it so we barely saw it. It was standing stock still about five yards away, and we could both smell it like piss and wet dog. There were another two behind it, and we presumed the rest were hiding behind us. We started chucking rocks at them, and by seven the sun was up. Out of nowhere a wolf lunged at me, and before I could use the spray it grabbed me and tugged. I screamed and looked down as it pulled my leg just like I'm pulling yours. Tonight, my husband took our dogs out for an evening walk in our yard. We live on two acres of wooded land in the country. After a few minutes, he came inside and tried to explain to me what he saw. He stated that something large and glowing flew in front of him, stopped, and then flew back off into the woods behind our home. He swore it looked like a human with wings. We looked up moths to try to debunk it and found nothing that he thought looked similar. We went back outside to see if we could see anything else. While outside, it reminded us that we have a couple security cameras pointed in our backyard. We ran upstairs and I had chills watching the video back. First thing we noticed, one of our dogs suddenly stopped with his tail pointed and was staring into the woods. A second later, you see something fly, basically flutter, in my husband's direction from the same place. It was large enough to be seen on a camera a good distance away. Unfortunately, it wasn't visible on our other camera. I was too shocked to record the footage, but plan to first thing tomorrow and I can share that here. But what does this mean? Why did it show itself to him? Is there something he should do? My husband didn't say a word and our dog was not even looking in his direction. Also, I trust what my husband saw. He said it was a fairy, and I believe him 100%. It was larger than any flying bugs we have around here. Glowing green in color. Not a moth and definitely not a lightning bug, as he was able to see its body, rounded head and wings. Also, no drugs or alcohol were involved, in case anyone was wondering. I wasn't posting to make anyone believe what he saw just looking for advice from others who have more knowledge to make sure our home, animals, and children are safe. Oh, God, I'm it. I forgot the one that actually made and fall down clutching my heart. I was camping and some of the group had gone off on a late night stroll. After a while, me and a friend got bored and decided to go look for them. It was pretty much rolling grassland hills with few trees out there, so we figured it wouldn't be hard. It was also unearthly quiet, other than the occasional distant owl or coyote sounds, so we were whispering and being very chill. There was pretty good moon, so we hadn't brought lights either. Anyway, I finally see someone standing under a tree on the crest of this hill, so I go up there first. I call out quietly and don't get a response. Again, no response. Kinda of annoyed, I just strut up there, but I'm realizing something looks weird about this person I've been seeing. They're holding their arms over their head, and the proportions aren't right. But I think that was all kind of subconscious, because I didn't do anything different until I got close enough to see that it wasn't a person at all, but a coyote that someone had flayed and strung up to the tree by the limbs like some kind of totem. I literally fell backwards in shock. Turns out the woman who owned the property was no fan of coyotes coming after her livestock. She also woke us all up in the middle of the night once with sustained AR-15 fire. Like 20 shots. Someone who lived near there just said, Oh, she must have found a whole pack of them. Go back to sleep. This encounter occurred just south of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in October 2018. I'm a professional photographer and work throughout the region. 
I have been fortunate to have a successful business, great clients and beautiful landscapes to work with. I went out one spring day for a wedding engagement shoot. The couple had specifically chosen the abandoned Piney Fork Tunnel for the location. I was familiar with it, so I agreed. We shot at a few other sites first, and then I met them out there late in the afternoon for the best lighting. I picked a good spot and started working. Everything was running smoothly at first until we started hearing the sounds coming from somewhere inside the tunnel. It was long enough that it was dark in the middle, so we couldn't see anything past a few hundred feet. It sounded like someone was moving around in there. We tried to ignore it and I just kept taking pictures, but the noises got louder like it was coming closer to us. The couple was now more uncomfortable and they looked tense in the pictures, so I suggested wrapping it up, but they wanted to finish. I got in another few shots before we heard the growling. We stared into the tunnel petrified. The sounds had been unsettling though not actually concerning. But the deep growling meant something very different. It sounded large and threatening. After a quick discussion, we decided to leave and go to a backup location. I started packing my lenses as the couple walked to their car. The growling continued and sounded as if it was getting closer. There was also a scraping sound. I panicked, grabbed my stuff and ran for the car. I got in and immediately locked the doors. The couple was already pulling out, but I had parked facing the other way and needed to turn around. As I did, there was a brief second where my running lights shined into the tunnel entrance. And that second, I saw the source of the sound. It was huge. It definitely was not a stray dog and many times larger than a German Shepherd, and it was standing on its hind legs, although it was bent forward. The beast was nearly seven feet tall. The head was covered in thick fur, and it had dog-like ears sticking up on the top of its head. I couldn't see the features clearly because it was too far away, but I saw the eyes reflecting in the light. The eyes had a deep orangish red color. I had absolutely no idea what I was seeing, but it walked on two legs. Then I blinked and it was gone. I followed the couple to the next location. When we got out I asked them if they had seen the thing in the tunnel, but they said they hadn't. I wasn't sure if I should tell them what I saw because it sounded too crazy, even though they had heard the growling. I decided to keep the details to myself. We finished their session as fast as we could. A few days later I was sorting through their photos and I got to the tunnel photos. As I had predicted most were not usable because the couple was too tense and uncomfortable in their poses. I looked through them carefully trying to find the best ones to include not wanting the location to be a total loss. In the last few images, I saw something weird. It looked like a glare or a light flare over the guy's shoulder. I zoomed in and played with the lighting until I saw it more clearly. It was not a lens flare. It was two orange eyes in the darkness of the tunnel. They appeared in each of the last few photos, and it was proof of what I had seen. The creature in the tunnel was real. I knew that I couldn't include those in the portfolio, not knowing what was leering behind them. I was out taking my dog on a short walk and to go to the bathroom. She was a rescue and was at this point terrified of everything, so getting her outside was always a task. It was 4 a.m. and she was whining at me. I figured she needed to go to the bathroom so I put on some shoes and took her outside. It was a warm night as it was July in Missouri. I'm walking down the street from my apartment complex and I see a figure standing under a streetlight, not moving. Thinking it was just a guy out for an early morning run, I kept walking. That's when this figure started to move towards me in a weird fashion. He wasn't jogging, wasn't walking, it looked like skipping. Thinking to myself, Ooh, what the F. I stopped walking. That's when my dog started growling from behind my legs. I'd had her almost six months and had never heard her growl or bark. I turned around and walked back into my complex. I looked over my shoulder and this dude is standing at the entrance to my apartment complex, head to toe in black clothing, grinning from ear to ear. I was fully in what the F is this bullshit mode and walked back into the complex further. 
while checking to make sure Smiles wasn't following me. I started to walk towards my entrance and he turned and slipped away into the night. I went and talked to my landlord the next day and she told me they'd had multiple reports of this guy skipping around the complex late at night, but whenever the cops showed up he was gone. So this is a story from my dad. Believe it if you wish or don't. But I think that by the end of this post, you too will believe in the Sasquatch. My dad and his buddy were adventurous in their youth. They would often sneak out at night to go for walks, along with their pit bull bow. One night they were on a trail leading through the woods. They came to a point where thick vines growing overhead blocked out the moonlight. The path fell pitch black, but my dad and his friend continued onward. They stumbled into some undergrowth and walked directly into a giant wall of hair. It grunted loudly and turned to face them. This creature stood up at least 10 feet tall and staring directly into my dad's eyes. Now you may think it was a bear, they stand on their hind legs right. You are correct, but bears don't run on two legs. This creature arose from its rest and upon seeing the two buddies and their pit bull took off into the woods. Bo gave chase and my dad sprinted back home with his buddy. They stayed on the porch the rest of the night, listening to the sounds of barking in the distance, worried about the dog. The next morning Bo returned covered in mud and dog tired. He slept all day and didn't move. The true hero of the story for protecting my dad and his friend. My dad didn't sneak out for another night walk for a couple months after that. He feared what might happen if he crossed paths with the beast again. Unfortunately for him, he was going to find out soon enough the next time he left through his bedroom window to go for a walk. Once more, it is the middle of the night. My dad is out once more with Bo and his buddy. They steered clear of the trail they took the last time. They walked in fear, jumping at every noise they heard. They still shuddered at the thought of the last time they went out on a midnight adventure. They made it safely on their trip, but it wasn't until they made it back to the driveway that they saw it again. It was a shadow illuminated by the moon, standing tall and fierce. It turned as if it was searching for them, and for a short moment zero. As if both the beast and the pair of friends were in disbelief that they were seeing each other again. Bo breaks the stillness and gives chase once again. My father seizes the opportunity to dive into some bushes with his friend. The beast runs by their hiding spot with the dog on its heels. They take this chance to make a break for the house, but when they look back the beast turned around and was coming back towards them. Now back in the day my dad could run a 40 in 4 seconds and this thing was on his heels. They make it on the porch and climb on top of it. They thought they were in the clear, but the beast managed to get a hand full of my dad's shirt and ripped it off. Bo had caught up at that point and chased the beast back into the woods. They never saw the monster again, but I may get the third sighting. We recently moved on to the property my father grew up on, and I am as adventurous as he was. Perhaps the beast will be seen again by myself, we can hope so, and I will surely update this if I am ever given such a chance. I swear on my life that what I'm about to tell you is true. It was a night etched in my memory, haunting my dreams like a specter refusing to be forgotten. The air inside the RV was thick with laughter and the buzz of excitement. We were a group of friends embarking on an epic road trip, the hum of the engine beneath us and the promise of adventure ahead. Little did we know our journey would take a sinister turn. It was on a desolate stretch of road far from any signs of civilization, that we saw him a hitchhiker standing on the side of the highway, a solitary figure in the moonlight. Against our better judgment, we pulled over, the screech of tires announcing our reluctant decision to welcome him aboard. As the night progressed, our mysterious passenger unfolded his dark history like a tattered map of horrors. He grew more erratic, his eyes reflecting the shadows of a past best left forgotten. Suddenly, without warning, he lunged at the driver, a frenzied attempt to take control of the wheel and send us careening into chaos. 
In the chaos that ensued, the driver struggled valiantly, but the air turned heavy with the scent of impending disaster. With a sudden lurch, the RV crashed, sending us sprawling into the night. Stunned and disoriented, we stumbled outside, only to find our would-be killer disappearing into the shroud of the surrounding woods. Fear gnawed at us as we fumbled for our phones, desperate to summon help from the authorities. Amidst the darkness, one of us saw something in the woods, a creature unlike anything we'd ever imagined a dogma. Its eyes glowed like twin orbs of malevolence in the moonlight. Towering on hind legs, covered in fur that seemed to absorb the shadows around it, the creature had the body of a man and the head of a monstrous wolf. It exuded a primal aura, and as it howled, the sound reverberated through the night, chilling us to the bone. Then, just as swiftly as it had appeared, the dogman vanished into the depths of the woods, leaving us trembling in its wake. By the time the police arrived, we were a jumbled mess of frantic words and terror, we recounted our harrowing experience, the crash, the attacker, and the monstrous creature that had haunted the periphery. The police, however, regarded us with skepticism. They exchanged glances as if we were a collective hallucination, dismissing our tale as the product of a wild imagination, or perhaps too many hours on the road. But I swear, as sure as the moonlight that illuminated that desolate stretch of road, our encounter with the hitchhiker, the crash, and the otherworldly dogmen were not the fever dreams of an exhausted mind. Some things, it seems, are just too dark for others to believe. My girlfriend and I had driven down an old dirt road that ran beside a lake on one side with mountains on the other. We were looking for unexplored territory to hike in. The dirt road became a trail and eventually was swallowed up entirely by the forest. Once the path became impassable by car, we got out and hiked for quite some time and began making our way back to the car as the sun was going down. It was a challenge getting the car turned around, but I finally managed and we were off. It was slow going as it was a shitty road and getting dark fast. Suddenly we came to fork in the path that hadn't been visible coming the other way. Neither of us had any idea whether to go right or left, so I just picked randomly, hoping that both would end up taking us back to the main road. As we rounded a small curve in the road, our headlights fall upon a man dragging a large hockey duffel bag off the trail into the woods. As soon as the lights hit him, he just froze completely still. Driving past him felt like an eternity because we couldn't have been doing more than five miles an hour due to the shitty road. My girlfriend and I didn't say a word to each other until we were well past him. At which point we were like, WTF was that? And then the road ended. Just like where we had stopped the first time, the forest had swallowed up this part of the road. We were going to have to turn around and drive by the man with the human-sized duffel bag again. I told my girlfriend to buckle up and hold on tight because at the first sign of trouble I was going to gun it. We came to the spot where the man was, and he was nowhere to be seen. We eventually made it to the right path and got the F out of there. The weirdest thing about it was that there wasn't a vehicle anywhere near this guy for 50 miles in either direction. We would have seen it if there had been. We traveled as far as possible both ways, and there just wasn't a place to pull off of the road. How the hell did he get there? Where was he going? What was in the bag? On Tuesday afternoon of this week, a few minutes after six o'clock, I noticed from my window a very peculiar, solitary, vapory object in the heavens. Its position was about where the constellation of the Dipper would be at that hour, viz. due north and 35 degrees above the horizon. In magnitude and contour it in a marked degree resembled a human form, head, body, and nether limbs, the body and limbs robed in shadowy drapery. The head, which was of brighter luminosity on the crown and forehead, had thick flowing hair, and the whole figure was extended horizontally, with the head eastward and the front downward. But there was another feature quite as marked, and that was an appearance as of wings projecting upward and backward from the shoulders, and these in due proportional extent to the body and limbs. 
This last named feature gave the entirety the appearance of an angel. Flying in mid-heaven, considered as a cloud, it was remarkable that it kept the same outline continuously, which is uncommon in those vapory objects. While I had it in view for a considerable time, as it progressed swiftly toward the east. The luminosity of the shadowy angel was of a golden white, and it presented a very beautiful appearance against the blue background of the sky. In addition to the startling outline of the object, the interest in it was greatly increased by its being at the time the only one visible in the whole northern heavens, except some low-lying black clouds on the horizon. I called the attention of several persons to it, one of whom discovered himself the resemblance I did. Query was this a presage of a coming event. It reminded me of the words recorded in Mark 13, 27. Then shall he send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, and those in Daniel 9, 21. Gabriel being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. I was walking through the woods after fishing for the better part of the day. I decided to stay out real late and try and fish up some bullheads from a local watering hole. I was only about 13 and stayed out way later than I normally would. Usually I would take a trail home, but decided to cut through some thicker brush to get to my grandparents' house so I could call my mom. I knew she'd probably be freaking out a bit even though this happened from time to time. There was an abandoned graveyard on my route. I don't remember what the story was about it, but I knew it was there. I had wandered past it before, never really checked it out. It's all overgrown and wild. I knew that if I followed on the outskirts of the graveyard, I'd hit the road and be home free. The day had been pretty chilly overall for a late spring day, but I swear in my teenage brain that it was getting colder. I remember looking at my breath and thinking it was weird how cold it had gotten. It was overall a pretty bright night near full moon, but in the woods it was hard to see. The graveyard was wide open, no trees. It was well lit. As I was walking up I noticed that the ground was covered in a thin layer of fog and remember looking into the graveyard and not really registering what I saw at first. It was a person which at first didn't seem odd so I kept quiet and walked into the woods a bit more so I didn't get spotted. I didn't know who it was, so I wanted to keep clear. I stepped behind some trees and lost sight of them for a moment, and when I came back around the tree, they were gone. Weird, because I was behind the tree for maybe a few seconds tops. I didn't hear anything either. I walked a bit further, keeping an eye out. I was a bit creeped out. Near the graveyard was a rundown, barn. I'm not really sure, but as I got closer to it, I could see that someone was inside. I got a good look, and it was a woman, probably in her fifties. The way the moonlight hit her made her look incredibly pale. She seemed to be digging, but I didn't hear anything. No sounds of a shovel or her making noise in any way. I was maybe thirty feet away. I could see she stopped and disappeared behind some debris. I decided to get the heck out of there and quickly moved to get out to the road. I tried to keep track of her, looking for where she went, but I couldn't find her. It was like she literally disappeared. I kept trucking and came out to the road. The fog was pretty much covering the road, a small country road, fields on one side, woods on the other. As I walked down the road she would randomly appear behind and in front of me and I started hiding and basically playing cat and mouse. Each time I saw her, she was hard to see, only in the moonlight and stuck to the remnants of some of the old houses nearby. She always looked pale, never made any noise. Once I got past that part of the road which had a number of barn foundations and home remnants, I never saw her again and it instantly started getting warmer. Creeped me the heck out and I never went that way again. I don't know who or what that was, but I told my uncle about it, and he went and checked it out, thinking maybe someone was maybe trying to excavate the graves. He said there wasn't anything messed with. They thought I was lying. Still gives me the shakes just typing this out. I know it was most likely someone wandering around looking for stuff or checking the place out, but what teenage me remembers didn't seem natural. 
It was also weird that she never made noise. She also seemed to be able to just appear and move around me. At one point she was right behind me, and I swear a moment later she was in front of me. I work as a seasonal park ranger here at Lassen National Park in California. One Friday afternoon, my brother and I, who were working together, came across a pile of scat that we thought was a goat's, but we knew it was not mountain goat feces. It looked different. We've seen mountain goats around here before, and the scat was much larger and darker in color. It appeared fresh and still kind of wet. We have no idea what this could have been. There are no other animals in the park that produce scat this large. We've also had people report to us that there is a massive black wolf in the park that's twice the size of a regular wolf. People have claimed that it had red eyes and was the size of a large, large Great Dane. And this, of course, has still been unconfirmed. I have seen a lot of strange things in the park myself that I have no explanation for what they could be. There was even a woman who had reported seeing what she referred to as Goat Man, but after going on a search, we could not find anything. Of course, as weird as it is when we go looking for these things, the woods always seem to have a way of going quiet and getting this feeling like you're being watched. Now that might just be my paranoia, but I feel a little more level-headed than letting my paranoia control me like that and just imagining things. I'm not exactly sure what all these sightings are about, and I simply don't believe they are all just simply misidentifications. And speaking of which, there is a gentleman I spoke to about seven months ago who was over on the east section of the park, and at one point or another, was actually attacked by what he describes as a bipedal coyote or wolf. He wasn't sure which. This thing actually tore aside in his tent during the nighttime while he was sleeping and attacked him. It tore his arm pretty well, and fortunately, he did not have to lose his arm, and they were able to save it. But he shot this thing right in the face multiple times until it finally fled. He said, had he not been heavily armed with his Glock, he has no idea what would have happened. He probably would not be alive. He said this creature looked evil and was very, very big. But he kept saying coyote more than wolf and said it looked very human in the way its eyes looked, not in the literal sense he described, but the intelligence, the intent behind what it was doing. He described it as if it was wanting to not only hurt him, but know that it wanted to hurt him. This, simply put, was just evil. I went to this kind of outdoor education boarding school when I was 14, 15 in the Victorian Alps in Australia. We hiked the mountains in that area almost every weekend, usually doing two, three night hikes, sometimes longer. We had heard from teachers and locals that there were hermits in the mountains who lived in shacks or drifted between the old cattlemen huts. We just brushed them off as stupid stories that the teachers tell you to spook you. However, we did this one hike at the tail end of winter that kind of lead me to believe there were actual hermits living in the mountains. Basically, we were doing this four-day hike at the end of winter, so it was super gloomy, foggy, and cold the whole hike. The Victorian Alps are famous for their cattlemen's huts, which are all over the high country. We would hike from hut to hut, but we rarely stayed in them because it was one of the school's rules. So we were hiking on the second day on this steep ridge, and it was mega foggy and cold. You couldn't see into the valley, only down the sloping edges of the ridge. When you're hiking long distances, you don't really talk the whole way, and since it was miserable, we all just had our heads down walking straight. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a black dog about 50 meters down the side of the ridge. It wasn't a dingo because it was jet black and had a collar on. Looked kind of like a border collie. I had only just registered it was a dog in my mind when I swear I saw a man walking behind the dog. He looked homeless and was looking up at us. Bear in mind it was really foggy and this guy was darting in and out of trees. I turned around and told my mate I saw a dude and his dog on the trail below. He was still visible so I pointed him out and my mate freaked a little too and told everyone else to look. 
In the moment of getting my group six guys to stop hiking and all look, he was gone. Everyone other than myself and my mate who saw him shrugged it off as a day hiker and his dog. We joked it was a hermit, but didn't speak about it much after. We arrived at our campsite, which was the Vallejo Gartner hut. We couldn't stay in the hut, so we set up camp on the flat ground around it. We set up, cooked dinner, and got ready to sleep. I didn't think much about the man and dog I saw earlier, but now it was getting dark it kinda crept into my mind. There is this awesome toilet at this hut that overlooks the valley below. Honestly an awesome shitter. It was almost dark and I need a shit so I headed to the loo. As I was sitting there and looking at the view, I was feeling a little creeped out, I don't know why. Now one thing to note is that these huts are all covered in scribbles and people's names, little sayings, etc. Like literally every square inch is covered in something. So off cue never really read anything on the walls if you stay at these huts like every weekend. Though as I reached for the toilet paper these words literally jumped out at me. Run. Run. He's coming. Run. I never wiped my ass faster. Combined with what I had seen earlier and my creepy feeling, I just bolted out of the bathroom into my tent. The guy I was tenting with actually was the one who had also seen the dude so I told him what I saw in the bathroom. We both became pretty paranoid and just sort of laid there for hours not making a sound. Eventually, I went to sleep. Shit really gets weird when the next day we woke up to find huge portions of our food missing. We keep the food in the outside bit of our tents in our hiking packs and then inside zipped bags. Half of my group's outside tent flies were undone with the packs open and food bags were strewn over the ground. We thought it was a wombat originally, but the bags were literally unzipped and our hiking packs had buckles to open them. My thinking was the dude I saw earlier was a hermit and followed us to our camp and stole our food at night. Honestly creepiest shit I have ever experienced. I was hunting in a forest during gun season in Michigan in the early 2000s. My spot was the far edge of a swamp. To get to it, I walked a trail that sort of cut through the middle past this huge gnarled dead tree. Its limbs curled like a dead hand reaching towards the sky. It was straight from a horror movie. This particular morning the fog was out but not horribly thick. I reach this tree and I'm panning the flashlight looking out over the swamp. I see this top black shadow running through the swamp. It looked like a humanoid figure and faded after a few seconds. I scream at the top of my lungs as I see this figure and then nothing. I reach my cousin who was 100 yards away on the FRS radio and he said he never heard my scream. Last time I was away sailing, we docked for the night, fair enough. It had been a long day on the open waters, and the peacefulness of the marina was a welcome change. The sun had just dipped below the horizon, casting a warm orange hue across the sky as we secured the boat and prepared to unwind. I was just chilling above deck with one of my buds aboard, the gentle lapping of the water against the hull creating a soothing background melody. The cool breeze rustled my hair, and the scent of the salt water mingled with the faint aroma of dinner being prepared in the galley below. It was the kind of tranquil evening that made all the challenges of sailing worthwhile. And then, as if a switch had been flipped, the serenity was shattered. The water around us started rippling towards the boat, rocking it slightly. At first, we exchanged puzzled glances, wondering if it was some strange phenomenon caused by the tide or a passing ship. But the ripples grew stronger, more pronounced, and there was an undeniable sense of movement beneath us. My heart quickened, and I shot a bewildered look at my friend. Do you see that? I stammered, my voice tinged with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. He nodded, his eyes wide with a mix of curiosity and concern. Yeah, something's not right. We gave the area a quick glance over, searching for any logical explanation. Maybe it was just an underwater current playing tricks on us. But our rationalizations were cut short when we heard a faint whispering, like a soft breeze carrying distant voices. Unease settled over us as we exchanged another glance, our senses heightened. Without a word, 
We decided to go grab some snacks from the galley and return to the deck, our curiosity getting the better of us. That's when we saw them, the source of the unsettling phenomenon. Shadow figures, haunting and ethereal, emerged from the water like wraiths. Transparent holes for eyes stared through us, their forms shifting and morphing as if they were made of smoke and mist. It was terrifying. My heart raced and my breath caught in my throat as I tried to make sense of what we were witnessing. Were these apparitions lost souls from some long-forgotten maritime tragedy? Or was there some natural explanation that had eluded us? The figures didn't move quickly. They drifted with an eerie, deliberate slowness. It was as if they were studying us just as intensely as we were studying them. My mind raced, considering whether we should attempt to communicate or retreat to the safety of the cabin. But the decision was made for us when the figures began to advance, their ghostly forms gliding over the water's surface. Panic surged through me, my instincts screaming that this was a danger beyond comprehension. Without a second thought, my friend and I bolted, practically tripping over each other in our haste to get back inside the cabin. The boat's engine roared to life, and we powered away from the marina, putting distance between ourselves and the inexplicable encounter. My heart pounded in my chest as we sped through the dark waters, the night air echoing with our ragged breaths. As we finally slowed to a safer distance, we turned to look back at the marina. The shadow figures were gone, faded into the night like a twisted dream. We exchanged a shaky glance, our minds struggling to process the surreal events we had just witnessed. We never found out what those shadow figures were, or if anyone else had ever experienced such a haunting encounter. But one thing was certain that night would forever be etched into our memories, a chilling reminder that the mysteries of the sea run far deeper than we could ever fathom. One evening my radio had kicked in with someone else reporting that they had seen the same thing I had, something that I'll never forget. This thing that I saw scared me half to death, that's for sure. I was working the evening shift, patrolling the watershed and keeping an eye out for people who may or may not be illegally fishing. I was hiking up along a creek. This creek feeds into a river, and I saw a large, dark, furry thing by some trees across from where my patrol vehicle was parked. It stood as still as a tree, its arms raised slightly, at its size like it was sniffing the air and stretching. It had to have been over eight feet tall, judging by where it was standing by a tree, and built like a linebacker wide shoulders and chest tapering down to its slender hips. I could see muscles tensing along its legs as it crouched slightly. I was startled and immediately thought of the people I'd encountered on duty before, usually drunk kids and groups of teens getting rowdy around campfires. But this time, this was something entirely different, something inexplicable, and all alone out here in the middle of nowhere, with no backup. I didn't think I froze in place, hoping that it had not seen me, while I studied the bushes where it was crouching, waiting for it to move again. That's when my radio started buzzing with the other rangers reporting seeing the same thing. That's when this thing took off running, full speed, into the woods. I could see along the side of it where I was standing on top of a hill overlooking the river valley. It disappeared quickly behind some trees, ran like nothing I'd ever seen before powerful strides, moving its legs back and forth in giant leaps up the hills towards town, but not before stopping long enough to look straight at me without ever slowing down. It had green eyes that shone bright in the night, I was terrified from this, and I still have no way to explain what sort of animal this was. My ranking was Staff Sergeant E6, and I was in charge of a security firewatch platoon. We handled perimeter defense on the flight line and security at the Squadron Operations Center. We also managed the odd green sheet patrol on base after dark, looking for would-be intruders. This part of my story occurred back in the 1960s. I served with the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing at the Yuban Air Base in Thailand. At the time, I was a replacement airman fresh from the USA and not long in country. The squadron to which I was assigned had just turned over almost all of its aircraft to the 388th TFW, which took our F-4DS, 
including my platoon's aircraft, and sent us back to the USA. My unit only had five F-4Cs left in the country, so I was not going anywhere soon. I had some time on my hands. We were on the flight line about midnight, minding our own business when an airman came screaming out of the night, heading toward us from across the flight line. I thought he was a fire marshal or an airman on firewatch, checking to see if anybody was out by the flight line. I couldn't understand why he needed to run though. He ran up to us and was gasping for breath. He told us that we had been on firewatch during the flight line, and he saw something out over the end of the runway 129. He said it was a bright reddish-orange object that came in from the west, slowly across the field to the east. It hovered for a short time above an aircraft revetment area before slowly drifting out of view to the south. He said he stood in disbelief for a few seconds until it came back out from behind some trees. He said it was this time it slowly moved toward him and hovered over building 7357, also known as the AGE hangar. We refueled our aircraft with JP-4, he said. It looked like a huge fireball with a greenish-bluish hue glow around it. He said he could see rivets in the object and what looked like a dome on top. It was about the size of an F-4C, which was about 53 feet long with a wingspan of 38 feet. He said the dome was about 20 feet in diameter, and it had some kind of windows or ports on each side. He said it had stayed there for a short time before slowly turning to the south and disappearing behind some trees. We radioed flight control about our Firewatch Airmen's report, but they said they had not reported anything unusual. They told us to keep an eye out for anything suspicious, but there was nothing else until about an hour later. There was an airman on duty at the AGE hangar who had just relieved his replacement. He radioed flight control, and he thought there was a small fire inside the AGE hangar. At first, they did not believe him. There were no reports of any aircraft being in the area. After about five minutes, they told him to call us for assistance. When we arrived, our Firewatch airman was already there and said that he had seen the object in question, that it was hovering over the AGE hangar when he first saw it. He said it came out from behind the trees and was hovering over building 7357 like before, and he saw it for a second time. There was definitely something strange going on. We entered the hangar and saw a glow in the corners. We pulled our fire extinguishers off of our jeep and headed into the hangar. It was still too dark to make out much, but we could see a reddish-orange glow emanating. We could feel the intense heat even though we were only 50 feet away. The section chief was already in there with his extinguishers and managed to knock down the glow. The fire was coming from a 12-foot deep vent in the floor which was shielded by a steel grate. The fire marshal went over to the hot grate, and it became red hot when he touched it. We all stood there in disbelief. We would later learn that the fire marshal had already pulled up the two great sidebars when he first saw the flames. We called flight control, and they sent coverall crews to help us with opening all the aircraft revetments to see if there were any fires in the adjacent aircraft. We found nothing that night, but it turned out to be a very eventful one for all of us. We never reported our lights in the sky sightings to anybody else that I know of. But the next morning, while eating breakfast, I informed my wife that there was a bright reddish-orange object in the sky heading toward Grand Forks at FB from the west. I never saw it, but she said it was very bright and that it appeared to be a trail of some kind behind it that was warping space and time. These were her words. I don't know if the sighting had anything to do with the fire in the AGE hangar that night, but I feel it is important enough to report this incident after all these years. I'm an old soldier now, retired from the U.S. Army after 20 years of active duty with two wars under my belt. I am also a former member of the U.S. Army Security Agency and was honorably discharged as an intercept operator. I would also really like to know if anybody else has had similar sightings or knew of this happening at Grand Forks during the 1960s. I hope somebody out there in the UFO community reads this and can shed some light on this very strange incident in my life.
Back in 2016, I was in Virginia, and my mom had gone through a pretty messy breakup. At the time, but we made the most of it by doing what we did, like hiking. She introduced me to her friend and her husband and children. Which one was a female my age cute girl? Off topic. It was a trail in the Blue Ridge part of the Appalachians. That day we were going to do old rag, but got there too late. During some points we would all be split up and sometimes I would be way back or way front. With this experience I was way in front of everyone, even the dog. Off topic again. One part of the trip we had stopped and rested at an overlook. Then we went on our way. We were about another, I say, 15 to 30 minutes into it, and I was way ahead. I remembered warnings from signs my mom, her friend, her husband, and another person that there was bears. But what I heard that day wasn't a bear. It walked on two legs and I was too far in front of everyone for it to be them. Besides, I would have heard the dog walking too since the cute girl was walking it behind me. I felt the sense of being watched when I heard the leaves crunching I believe in Bigfoot and the paranormal and I'm up for suggestions on what it was, it could have been Bigfoot or the rake I'm into all that folklore. I've got more stories that I want to share I just gotta get my internet shell off. My ex-husband may have seen a skinwalker one night. He worked the overnight shift in the big city of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Well, Santa Fe is bigger than the small village we were from that had two lane roads to travel to get to the main highways. He would leave our house at 10 p.m. to get to work by 11 p.m. One night I got a frantic call from him when he arrived at work. He sounded almost hysterical. He said he was driving down the usual road to get to the highway and came up to what he thought was a cow sitting in the middle of the road like they do sometimes. He slammed his brakes on and honked his horn annoyed that he was going to be late. He waited a bit and honked again and the cow stood up, and but he realized it was standing up in its hind legs. Then he realized it wasn't a cow, maybe it was a coyote or a wolf. He then saw that it was a naked man as it turned to face him, but the head was of a dog. The creature slammed its hands on the hood of the car and then bound off into the hills in three steps. He couldn't make out where it went, but my ex said he drove as fast as he possibly could to get out of the area and to the well-lit highway. Once he arrived at work 20 minutes later, he called me nit making much sense. When he calmed down a bit, we both tried to make out what he possibly could have seen. Even years later, we'd talk about it once in a while, maybe a dog man, maybe a drunken man wearing a mask. It wasn't until years later we came up with the possibility of a skinwalker. Maybe it was just some distortion of the darkness and headlights during late night driving. Maybe he was hypnotized by the driving, but he still thinks he saw something out of the ordinary. I've been avidly having nightmares of someone being in my small town living trailer for quite some time. I had nothing of it to actually say anything. Until now. A week leading up to this, I had a sleep paralysis moment where I've seen someone in my house and a co-worker stabilize me because I had a seizure in my dream, I think. Because I was convulsing foam and shit like a regular seizing victim. I remember my ex that used to live in this place by herself, saying she used to have nightmares and dreams of a person breaking in or being here. I never had resentment to that statement because we're Navajos. In the following months, I've been having nightmares of someone in my home. I'm always in a sleep paralysis moment. Until the other night, I see a person's silhouette from both windows and began to panic because it's at both front and back door. I called my parents and grandma but get no answer. So I called my aunt and she picked up the phone, questioned whatever was going on, and I explained to her the events. Now at this point I'm mad because it's causing me stress. So I told her I'm going to go outside and fight it. She told me otherwise and stay inside. A couple weekends ago my boyfriend and I went up to the North Carolina mountains to a cabin. The cabin was close to Silva and Maggie Valley. I don't want to say the exact location because the post might get deleted. 
The cabin is in the Smoky Mountains. My boyfriend is older than me by quite a bit, and he had been going to this cabin for his whole life. He told me a story about a man who knew when he was younger, and this was back in the old logging days. The man was named Joe and was very familiar with the woods and was an outdoorsman. One day Joe went in the woods and got lost, which is very unusual for him because he knows the woods like the back of his hands. He became very disoriented, and as he was trying to find his way home, a cottonmouth snake came out of nowhere and bit him in the eye. He eventually got out of the woods and returned home. Joe was known to be a very sweet man and would give you the clothes off his back, that kind of person. However, right after the incident, Joe became very mean aggressive, not like his nature at all. After a little while, Joe just disappeared without a trace. Shortly after this, a couple of the neighbors also disappeared without trace, as well as of the neighbor's livestock. Fast forward my boyfriend while he was still young, was enjoying a campfire with his friends. In the woods, they heard what he said sounded like someone hitting a tree with a cane. The thuds were very precise and came in series of threes. Example, thud, 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 silence thud, thud, thud. They joked around and said it might be Joe. Fast forward to present day, my boyfriend and I are at the cabin. He had told me these stories at the campfire. Maybe he was just trying to scare me and made these up, but I thought it kind of sounded like a windigo was behind the disappearances. Anyways, one night as we were sitting on the couch, and I heard what sounded like something tapping at one of the windows. The next day in the afternoon, we were sitting on the couch watching TV. We then heard what sounded like something very, very heavy on the roof, except it didn't sound like something walking. It's harder to describe, but it kind of just would make like two knocking sounds stop and then do it again. Later that night as we were in bed, I couldn't sleep, so I was on my phone. I heard what I thought I was talking and I listened harder and it was actually chickens that I heard. They were making that little warble sound that they do. I thought this was kind of weird because while there were chickens that came from the neighbor's house the other day when he was grilling, I didn't think chickens were nocturnal. Maybe they are. A few minutes after I stopped hearing the chickens, my boyfriend, who I didn't realize it was awake, started complaining how he couldn't sleep and decided to go to the car to find some Benadryl he left in it. I followed him, and while I didn't go outside with him, I stood on the porch and watched him. There were no chickens outside, and I didn't hear any at all. Maybe this is all just my imagination going crazy, but when I did hear the sounds, I pretended not to. I didn't really want to take chances. Could this have been a windigo? Was my imagination just running wild? From the stories I heard about Joe and people disappearing and the sounds I heard, I thought maybe it could be. My setting occurred in the year of 2011. In April, if I recall correctly, in the jungles of Indonesia. I was a sergeant at the time of my experience and expressed a desire to be posted in the jungle. It was known that I had jungle warfare training, so it wasn't too hard to convince my superiors that this would be a good idea. I was stationed at an army base just outside of a small town in Indonesia. The town is called Dumai. The base was on the coast, and the nearest town to the base is a small village called Bahau, and that's right around where the sighting took place. During my posting in April of 2011, I was preparing to participate in a jungle warfare exercise with my unit. I had just finished conducting reconnaissance on the objective and was returning back to base when I first saw the creature. I was roughly about a kilometer away from the base and was on a road that linked to Baja. It's a road that I'd taken many times before. The surrounding area was mainly filled with thick jungle but it wasn't hard to spot open spaces between. We were moving along this road when I saw an open space roughly 150 meters in front of me. I looked through the trees and saw something that I can only describe as a dragon. The creature was on the ground, its wings folded next to its body. It had a long, slender neck ridged by spines that extended back to its skull. It was gray in color with dim orange patches on the side of its neck and toward the end of its tail. 
I was going around 35 miles an hour when I first saw it, slamming on the brakes, skidding to a stop when I reached the spot where it was sitting. I never found out what this thing was. It just went away as soon as I saw it. It was unresponsive to my presence and seemed unconcerned by me. I didn't tell anybody else about it. It didn't seem right to report something that I had no concrete proof of. It was just my word against other people's. How, if someone even tried to tell me this, I'd call them a liar? I still didn't believe my own sighting. The really weird thing is that I've been to Baja before and never once saw anything strange. I'm an open-minded person. If it wasn't for the fact that I had gone to Baja before and never seen anything strange, I would think that I was going nuts. What was it? I want to state a few things. This incident takes place around one, two years ago. Initially, I wanted to post my encounter somewhere online, but the more I thought about this encounter, the more it consumed me and my thoughts. Sometime after the fact, I figured the best thing for myself was to try and forget. This didn't work, so instead I'll do my best to lay out what I saw. I live in North Carolina. It's not a small city by any means, but it's a highway town at its core. I've lived here for 10 plus years. On the night in question, I was with my ex. We'll refer to her as Z. This was right around the time when C-19 restrictions had yet to be fully lifted, so Z invited me for a walk. She was finishing up her online courses for the semester, one being physical activity, so we'd often walk around her neighborhood to reach a daily amount of steps. Anyways, we head out on this walk. It's around 7-8 p.m., so on our way out the sun is already setting. We stick to the street, as it isn't a sidewalk, and we're just walking through the neighborhood. I've been down this area hundreds of times. I drove there nearly every day to be with Z during the pandemic. It's just your average single-story cookie cutter. Every house looks identical neighborhood. On our way back to the house, it's dusk. A weird time of day, especially on this evening. It was almost a gray-looking atmosphere, but still illuminated enough to see the streets. Z is on a phone call for the entirety of the way back, so I'm just taking in my surroundings and waiting for the walk to be finished. That's when I see it. Whatever this thing was. About three houses down, mid-jump, arms and legs fully outstretched and leaping across the street. It lands on the other side in an instant, with barely enough time to register that anything had even happened at all. At the time, it felt like a hallucination, something fiction that my brain had just conjured up out of boredom or lack of visual content. It happened so quickly, but this flash frame is burned into my memory now and is something that I'll probably never forget. It was huge and 100% silent. I only caught sight of it flying across the street and landing underneath a car. It was fully outstretched and took up almost the entirety of the street. Even with its hands on the ground, its rear legs were still stretched from the jump and extended far beyond the halfway point of this two-lane road. I can only guess the size of this thing was from 10-20 feet in length. It looked extremely thin beyond anorexic, but startlingly human from the waist up. 100 percent dark gray. Its arms seemed to be car length, with large claws and its legs were bowed in a way that reminded me of a dog. The only feature I couldn't make out was its face. It seemed completely black, but scarily human. Again, at the time I had no idea if what I saw was some sort of weird animal or just a hallucination. Even so, I kept my eyes glued to where I had seen this hallucination land. As I got closer and closer to the car, I almost wanted to freak out. Z was still on the phone, though so I decided to keep quiet and inspect the car for myself as we walked by. I turned my head as we slowly passed by the vehicle. At this point, I'm convincing myself that what I had seen couldn't be possible, but I just couldn't bring myself to peer and look underneath that car. As we walk away, I turn back a few times, really trying to process if I lost my mind for a moment or not. By the time we get home, I feel almost embarrassed. Did I just have a stare down with a car for absolutely no reason? By the time we walk inside, 
Z's house, she's off the phone. We were kind of bummed that our walk was void of conversation, so we just catch up and converse for the next half hour. The hallucination had almost completely left my mind at this point. We just ended up going about our usual business. Honestly, I was just happy to be spending time with my partner. I was ready to accept that what had happened earlier was nothing more than my imagination. I had forgotten about the experience almost entirely. Until Z asked me something out of nowhere. Did you see something jump across the street earlier? I went on a night hike about 12 years ago with a meetup group, just to experience one. I knew no one there and I'm not one to make small talk. There were about 25 people there and beforehand we met in, in a small cabin on the property where the organizer laid down the rules. This person was stern. We were to remain completely silent and listen to the night sounds. Keep up with the leader. It was certainly creepy, walking quickly and quietly through the dark woods with strangers at your back. I think the leader was too rigid, and no one seemed to enjoy the experience. As soon as I spotted my car, I got in it and left. I'm 18 years old and recently graduated from high school. There have been some unexplained things going on in my home ever since we moved in last year. My younger brother was in his room carrying out a conversation which was weird because we were alone at home. I went to see who he was talking to. There was no one there, so I asked him who he was talking to. He said the little girl with the black eyes. I asked where she was and he said that she had left. I thought he just lying. About a week later we started hearing voices and footsteps. I would be sleeping with my blankets covering me and I would wake up with them folded at the bottom of my bed. My sister got scared one night and crawled into bed with me. As she was getting into my bed I woke up, so I turned on my TV. I also turned on my light to find the remote. I left the light on along with the TV. Right when we were both drifting off to sleep, my door slammed shut, which is almost impossible as I always have a basket full of books in front of the door so that it doesn't close. The light then shut off, and my TV picture went off with static noise. I got up and went to the door. I tried to open it, but it was like someone was holding the door handle from the outside. My sister and I started to scream when my mom came and opened the door. As she did, the light turned back on and the TV picture came back. We had a priest bless the house, but the activity continues. The house was built in 23 and no one has died there. Can you tell us what we need to do? Under the haunting glow of the moon, a pall of fear enveloped the Navajo tribe, for a malevolent skinwalker roamed amongst us a creature born of an ancient curse that left our settlement in the grip of terror. As the unsettling whispers echoed through our community, my heart, as a young warrior named Raki, felt a calling, an ancestral beckoning to confront the source of our dread. Guided by the spirits and stories passed down through generations, I embarked on a perilous journey to a sacred ground in the heart of present-day Oklahoma. Legends spoke of an ancient totem concealed in that hallowed place, an artifact believed to be a summoning ground for the Wendigo, the very entity empowering the malevolent skinwalker. The path was treacherous, winding through rugged terrain, guided only by the luminous stars above. The night air carried an ominous weight, and the distant howls of coyotes seemed to harmonize with the unsettling wind. Yet, with each step, I clung to the tales of my ancestors, allowing their echoes to guide me toward the heart of the darkness that had befallen us. Sensing the presence of the Wendigo long before I reached the sacred ground, I felt its malevolence weaving through the shadows. The creature, in its deceptive nature, took on various forms shadows dancing in the moonlight, echoes of unseen footsteps, and eerie calls that reverberated through the night. Yet my Navajo spirit, forged in the crucible of ancient tales and warrior teachings, would not waver. The Wendigo's attempts to instill fear only fueled the fire within me, transforming my apprehension into a steely resolve. Each step toward the sacred ground brought forth a symphony of fear and anticipation. As I neared the ancient totem, 
Standing tall like a silent sentinel, the air thickened with an otherworldly energy. The Wendigo, growing desperate, intensified its attempts to unsettle me. Shadows twisted, and the night seemed to come alive with unseen malevolence. Yet I pressed on undeterred. The confrontation unfolded beneath the silent gaze of the stars. The Wendigo emerged, a monstrous embodiment of fear and hunger, eyes glowing with an unnatural fire. Armed with my ancestral axe, passed down through generations, I faced the creature head-on, engaging in a battle that transcended the physical and delved into the spiritual. With a surge of strength and determination, I hurled my axe toward the ancient totem. The clash echoed through the night, a symphony of ancestral spirits colliding with the malevolence of the Wendigo. In that pivotal moment, the totem crumbled, and the Wendigo's guttural cry filled the air as its form dissipated into the ethereal void. Silence descended upon the sacred ground, the remnants of the curse carried away by the winds. Iraqi stood amidst the ruins of the totem, triumphant. The Wendigo's terror faded like a distant nightmare, and a profound calm settled upon the land. The Navajo tribe would know peace once more, and the legend of Raki, the warrior who faced the shadows, would resonate in fireside tales for generations to come. I would like to make it clear that this encounter was not with a Yi Nalbushii. However, it involves an indigenous medicine man who claimed to shape shift into an animal. I share this story in this subreddit in case readers are interested in skinwalker adjacent activities outside of the Navajo Nation. But if this is not the right place, I understand as I do not wish to disrespect the dying culture. When I was living in Mexico in the mid 2000s, I was enrolled in a beginner's Reiki workshop. I was a teenager then, very curious about spiritual practices, but also very naive. After one of our sessions, the instructor told me that a native medicine man, who was also a Nahuel shapeshifter, was going to host an event in our city. I begged my mom to take me to meet this man, and she agreed. We arrived at the hotel where the event was taking place, where I was introduced to this man, who called himself Night Jaguar. He was a very normal-looking man who appeared to be in his early fifties, and he was very friendly and easy to talk to. I don't remember much of our conversation, but it involved mentioning places where medicine people and witches would gather for ceremonies. Before the conversation ended, he asked if I could provide him with my home address. In my naivete, I gave him my address, and he provided me with his email so we could keep in touch. I was thrilled with the idea of communicating and possibly learning from a Nahuel. Medicine man, but I never heard from him again. It seemed like that was the end of it, until weeks later my dad storms into my room and tells me that he forbids me from talking to that damned Nahuel again. At this point I had given up on hearing from Night Jaguar, and I didn't understand why my dad would think we had been keeping in touch when we have not. I replied with okay, while wondering what was that all about. A long time had gone by when my dad told me what had led to his imposed moratorium on contacting Night Jaguar. One night, shortly after meeting Night Jaguar and giving him my address, my dad woke up from a deep sleep, feeling quite disturbed. In his own words, he felt as if there was a large and dangerous animal in his bedroom. One thing to know about my dad is that he has a keen sixth sense. He can see and feel energies around him. And although he couldn't see what was in the bedroom, he could feel that it was just observing. But more disturbingly, the energy was especially interested in my mom, who was asleep next to my dad. Being unable to go back to sleep, my dad just got up and told whatever was there that he could feel it, and that he knew what it was up to. The activity did not escalate and left soon after. Since my dad knew about my meeting with Night Jaguar, he deduced that the Nahuel was the source of the energy in the bedroom. Fortunately, that energy did not return after that night. After my dad shared about his encounter, I felt immense guilt as I placed my family in potential danger by foolishly giving our address to a complete stranger, Nahuel or not. My family was lucky that the Nahuel left us alone after that, 
I have read and heard about what kind of harm a witch and or a Nahul is capable of inflicting to families for a long period of time. Some people in Mexico believe that shapeshifters can be good or evil, but after my family's encounter, I am weary of trusting anyone who claims to be capable of shape shifting into an animal. If they are anything like ye nald lucii, I wish to stay far away from them. If you made it to the end of the story, thank you for your time. I have been wanting to share this story for a while now. If you have any questions about this encounter, feel free to ask. July of 1995, we were dropped off to survive with a fixed amount of rations within the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. I was a new Marine. My fire team consisted of four other Marines, one Navy corpsman, and three enlisted Marines. The first night, I sent one of our group out to set up a watch rotation. The next day, he comes back scared as heck, shivering and wide-eyed. He refused to tell us what happened, so we forced him. He said he saw a thing as tall in the trees, covered in hair, with big arms and red eyes. Our corpsman immediately set up a watch with him on it. That night, the corpsman went out to relieve whoever was on watch. As soon as he was out of sight, the corpsman comes sprinting back into our camp, wide-eyed and terrified. The look on his face when he said, You're not going to believe this, told us all we needed to know. That night, I got on watch, and he told me the story. He said that as soon as it was his turn to keep watch, he noticed a pair of red eyes a couple of feet from him. Whatever it was, it kept looking at the corpsman and growling. What happened next is a little fuzzy for me after all this time, but the corpsman said he couldn't see it anymore when his flashlight caught its eyes. He said that it was making these growling noises, was large and black, and a big black cat or a bear of some kind. The night the corpsman went out to relieve whoever was on watch, as soon as he was out of sight, the corpsman comes sprinting back into our camp, wide-eyed and terrified. The look on his face when he said, you're not going to believe this, told us all we needed to know. That night, I got on watch, and he told me the story. He said that as soon as it was his turn to keep watch, he saw a pair of red eyes a couple of feet from him. Whatever it was, I kept looking at the corpsman and growling. What happened next is a little fuzzy for me after all this time, but the corpsman said he couldn't see it anymore when his flashlight caught its eyes. He said that it was making these growling noises, was big, black, and bear-like. He said it stayed right next to him the whole time, and when it stood up, he stood up. He said when he turned to run back to our camp, it began coming after him. He said the closer it got, the more he began running. He said he ran all the way back to our camp in record time. I remember us laughing because there was no way something could have chased him back. Well, the next day, we all went to look for tracks. It turned out that whatever it was, it was as tall as a man, and it had three toed paw prints and really long claws on its toes. It may have been a bear, I don't know. After that, we never heard anything else, and we were all fine. We even saw the Navy corpsman a little while ago, and he remembered it like it was yesterday. So anyway, we're all fine and we're out there, and the Navy corpsman goes out to relieve whoever is on watch again. Now it's the third day, so I'm kind of out of it at this point. I mean, we're seeing a lot of deer and turkey and other signs that there's wildlife here, so that's a good thing. While the corpsman is out there, everything's fine and dandy. We're all just sitting around talking about what we would do when we got out. The more I think about it, the more I wonder where he is. Just as some of us are about to stand up and go look for him, the dude who was on watch comes sprinting into our camp, saying that something's right behind him. We all look at each other and ask him what he's meaning, and that's when we all hear the growl. It sounds like a bear, but much deeper, like a weird kind of bear that I've never heard before. It is very deep, like the sound you hear in the movies when there's a monster. What came next is something I'll never forget. It reminded me of when my grandpa showed me the Jersey Devil stories when I was a kid. We all drew our guns and waited for whatever it was to come into full view. We're all looking around for it. Then we see the corpseman. He's running toward us from his post, but there's something big and black following him. 
We all start yelling and the run faster. Whatever was following him was not stopping. It looked almost like a large cat chasing a mouse, but a cat in humanoid form. It was the same height as the corpseman when it stood up. It was taller than any of us. The next thing I remember is seeing something black pass in front of me. Then everything began moving slowly. It was like a scene in a movie where time slows down and all the details are there. I could finally make out what was chasing him. It came into view. It was black, it was hairy, and had wings. I can't remember seeing any arms or not, but if they were, they were smaller compared to the rest of its body. Its face was feline-like, having reddish-yellow eyes glowing. Then I saw its hands. They were almost backward, but had very long claws. In fact, they were most likely like talons, just very large. It kept running toward us, and the closer it got, the more noise it made. It was like this really loud hissing mixed with howling. Just as it got closer to the corpseman, he tripped. He said something about seeing its claws going after him right before he fell. Right when the corpseman tripped, it flew up into the air. It started coming down fast. When it was just a few feet from him, I remember that's when we got to him. There was blood everywhere. The thing was pissed and now dove down at one of us while trying to retrieve his body. I don't know if it was trying to take him back to its lair or wherever it is, but we're not going to let that happen. It dove at one of us, but we shot it down before it could touch him. But there was a lot of blood on the ground where he had been laying. After we shot it, it let out the scream and dove off into the trees away from us. We used this moment to grab his body, pulling him back to our camp to attend to him. I remember talking about it with some of the other guys after the incident. We all believed that the thing was not from this world. We also remember what the corpseman said right before he was taken. He was screaming but eventually passed away due to blood loss within minutes of this thing tearing him open. The only thing he managed to say before his death was, it didn't get me. Our training mission was then aborted within hours after this happened. We will never forget what happened that evening, and we all wanted answers. I can't remember why but I have a feeling someone on our team knew what it was that took him down. It was so dark. I think one of our team members saw something. We were all wondering what it was that attacked us. I'm fairly certain that what we had encountered was indeed a Jersey Devil. I can't be sure, but I have this feeling we lost a good soldier that day. Don't let anybody feel with these fake stories that they're harmless. He was torn open and bled out. This was no ghost or folklore, the man's gone. It's an event none of us will forget. Personally, I won't step foot in the Pine Barrens again after all this. Growing up in the woods was something different. Let's get this straight, I'm just an average person growing up in the woods. Well, not average, but I am normal to a certain extent. I live out in the wilderness in a large forest reserve in the United States. I've lived with my grandparents with most of my life. I've never really known my parents before this, but nevertheless, to a certain degree, it doesn't matter. I live in the middle of the wilderness up here. Nowadays, my grandparents will be here for a day or two, then leave for a day or two. The length and time they stay and go varies, but in the summertime, I only have a handful of friends that are even remotely able to come hang out with me. I live in a very remote area of the place where I live and all you can see from where I am is mountains and trees. The closest town is around four miles away, and all it really is is a small shopping center with a general store and such, but that's about it. Some gas, some food, nothing special. Oftentimes I get the cabin to myself. It's not exactly an old wooden cabin if you're thinking about it. It's actually very nice. It has four bedrooms and three bathrooms. It's practically a lodge, but all it's missing is a garage. Our cars park in a sort of tent thing. It's just a bunch of wooden poles holding up a sheet metal roof. Because of this, during the winter, we'll often be stuck inside our little cabin for days, weeks, and every once in a while months. I've learned to go hunting, melt ice into water, and basically become self-sufficient from my grandfather. 
Going to school in this part of the country is kind of like it's optional. For the sake of keeping us secure, I'll use different names for my friends in future stories, so don't try and come find us. The woods are a strange place, it's like they're their own giant, sentient being. My friends Thomas and James would occasionally head down to a nearby creek a few miles from my house. It was a large creek, almost a river, but it was nothing we couldn't handle. Oftentimes during the summer we'd go out for hours without our cell phones and go explore. We all had cell phones, but there's practically no reception out there unless you're directly inside one of the houses, so most of the time they were just useless. Thomas and James were my best friends ever since I could practically think. We all lived within a six-mile radius, a tiny distance considering the size of most of the town. Thomas lived closer to me so he'd often come over if I was stuck at home. More often than not we'd sit down in the lounge room and just watch old movies that my grandparents had. Our cabin had a large glass window across the front wall, so you could always see into the distant wilderness. One time, a few years back Thomas, my friend David and Jasmine were over. It was raining and my grandparents were out for a few days. David and I became close since he moved in that year. I had only recently gotten my license so it was a dream. It was storming outside so I just planned to let David and the others stay the night. It was dark out already, maybe around 10 when the four of us were sitting upstairs in the lounge room watching Stand By Me, one of mine and Thomas's favorite movies. We were watching it when we heard a large clanging nearby the garage area. Originally I shrugged it off as wind blowing over the trash cans or raccoons tipping them over until I heard the crash of metal against the building. Despite the rain outside, I knew the wind outside wasn't nearly that powerful to lift the trash can up to smash it into the cabin. I got up and managed to convince Thomas to come with me as I walked towards the outside. Before I went downstairs, I entered my grandparents' room and took the shotgun just in case it was a bear or something. Thomas took the fire poker and walked behind me, scared as a bat when I came to the front door. I looked outside and saw nothing yet. I counted to three before I opened the door to go outside. This wasn't the first time I had to deal with a bear digging through my trash. F bears and shit. Anyway, Thomas and I go outside and scope outside the area. The rain was lighter than I thought it was as the pitch black sky caked the entire yard in darkness. Thomas and I move forward towards the trash can. I know you're not supposed to keep your finger on the trigger. But I'm that moment all I could think about is getting that bear away from me. I hated bears ever since I was young. They scared the shit out of me, but I never felt this fear before. I turned the corner with Thomas and found one of the trash cans lying on the ground. I sighed in relief as Thomas looked shocked, looking past the trash. I noticed this so I asked him what was up. What are you looking at? Don't you see it? See what? The big mother F. Thomas pointed forward at a figure behind the tree line. I squinted to see it clearly and made out the figure of a bony, fur-covered being. I looked over at Thomas, telling him it was just a bear and to come on and go. Thomas looked in shock as he pointed forward. Why is it looking at us like that? I glanced back, being met with yellow, glowing eyes from the darkness. I took the shotgun and ran with Thomas back to the house. Before I ran inside, I tripped and shot my gun. It was one of those times where if Thomas wasn't there, I wouldn't be here today. Thomas stopped to pull me up as this weird, distorted roar came from the woods. We didn't have to exchange words to understand it was coming towards us. I left the shotgun and ran inside. Thomas and I slammed the door shut, hell out of breath as we heard the creature walking around. Thomas told me to go upstairs, get the others and barricade ourselves in my bedroom. I nodded and quietly went upstairs, doing just that. Thomas met me there shortly after, holding his spare hunting rifle he always brought with him when he came over. We all spent the night in the same bedroom, guarding each other as we heard the thing walking around the cabin over and over again. I fell asleep sometime during the night and woke up the next morning. Going out to the lounge area felt like it was freezing, every window was open. Nothing was stolen, surprisingly, but there was definitely someone or something inside of here. 
Thomas and I went outside that morning and found my grandparents' shotgun sitting on the front stoop, the barrel bent to an impossible angle. I had no excuse for that when my grandparents came home. Oftentimes during the school year, after school our school had a small skiing program where around 40 to 50 kids all got together on a bus or two to go skiing after school. Doing this was one of the few fun options we got to do for extracurricular around here. Our high school was small, maybe only 300 kids total. I know small town. We only had one elementary school and one middle high school, where grades 6 through 12 all went to the same school. Often enough, my friends and I would do this during the winter to give us something to do. We took a bus around 30 miles to a nearby campus with a large skiing hill in the area. The town was an entire campus town. Everyone was connected to the college in some way around there. Often, James and I, along with some of our friends determining the circumstances, would all go skiing together. The mountain wasn't all too big, but the trails were certainly long. Each run would take 10 to 15 minutes to reach the bottom. On this particular occasion, I was with my friend James. Not a lot of my friends liked skiing, so often enough it was just James and I. It was a few years ago when we decided to go with the bus after school. After a relatively short ride, we got off the bus and got our equipment on. We skied for a couple hours with little event. It was just beginning to get dark when James revealed he had a little bit of dope on him. In my high school years, we were what you would call the stoners. James would always get weird shipments, usually just weed, but it would get us off our ass. James pulled me aside and told me he wanted to smoke a joint or two and asked me to come with him. Me, being a teenager that wanted to get high as well, agreed to come with. We skied off the path a little ways until we were in a place where we thought we wouldn't be noticed. It was slightly past the ski mountain border, so we knew no one would come looking for us. James took out the wrapping paper and rolled us both a joint. We made sure we weren't going to be seen, so we took off our skis and sat under a little overhang of leaves and logs that we made the previous winter. We began talking about what teenagers talk about, girls, video games, our home life, all that shit. As it got darker, James pulled out some candles and lit them, getting us a little bit of light to wrap more weed. After a while, we decided that we'd finish up the last joint and head back, since it would be around an hour when the bus left back to the school. James and I began packing up when an odd noise came from the woods. It didn't sound like from an animal or anything, but more robotic, like a broken drill on a low battery. James caught on quicker than I did, alerting me to the noise. If we were sober, we would have most likely hightailed it out of there as soon as we heard it. But like dumb high teenagers, I thought it would be a good idea to go find the noise. James agreed to come with me as we had already packed up what we had and set it on the path. James and I both took a candle, walking off towards the noise. The closer we got, the more prominent the noise became, although never growing louder. We walked further into the woods maybe 50 feet when we realized we must have passed it as the noise became more soft. We began searching around for the noise using our candlelight. Back then we never brought our phones on such journeys, we always just brought our watches and wallets to go explore. James walked close towards this evergreen tree as suddenly the snow below it suddenly fell. James fell into a tree well as I heard him yelp in surprise. I ran over and looked down and I shit you not there was just a square hole. It must have been a trap door as I looked closer, seeing the reflective patch on James's jacket. I called out to James to see if he was alright. James replied for me to come down there. I know, straight out of a horror movie, but in our messed up minds we thought, oh cool, a trap door in the woods. I obviously obliged, sliding down into the slot in the floor. It was around the size of a kitchen sink, so it was a tight squeeze in. I dropped down with my candle as the room seemed to light up more. It looked like a bunker as all the shelves and such were entirely devoid of anything. That's when I heard James call me over towards a small steel door along the side. James had a concerned look on his face as I walked over, peering through the window. I was met with only a partially lit room with a single candle sitting inside. 
It looked like a meat locker room with several rotting animal corpses hanging on meat hooks. I'm so glad the door was shut because I could only imagine the smell. By then I was sobering up a bit more and realized how messed up this was. I called over to James that we should leave when I hear the familiar buzzing again. I look over and see James rushing back towards the hatch, climbing out as fast as he can. Seeing James react like that is rare. Usually he was the calmest person in the group. So seeing him run, so afraid, I chased after him, scrambling after him. The two of us ran towards our skiing equipment up on the ridge where James was hastily putting on his skis. I asked him what happened that spooked him like that. What James told me shook me up. You know how there was that whirring sound coming from there? Yeah. Well, I saw what was making the noise. It was a camera. Oh shit. That's not it. Then what? It was a motion camera. Something was down there with us. That sentence still resonates in my mind. We weren't the only ones down there, and I'm so glad I didn't find out what was down there with us. I know it's not the scariest story out there, but it's something that stuck out to me. Maybe I'll even go back if I can get over the fear of it. It was a couple years ago anyway, and the ski hill has since shut down that section of the mountain due to unsafe hazards. A year ago, it could be a good bonding exercise for James and I to explore since after James got into urban exploring despite the terror he felt there. This next story came from my grandfather when I was just a little boy. My grandpa is usually a very reserved man, but occasionally when he has a few drinks down the hatch, he'll open the hatch a little bit for me to peer inside. This story happened one fall evening when I was little. I'll tell this story from his perspective so it's easier on the writing. I shit you not we weren't expecting to find anything out in there. Even though I know there's weird shit going on around here, I know it's unlikely to run into that stuff. I went out for a hike that day at noon. It was the type of fall where everything was beginning to turn red and yellow, but still warm during the day. God, it was a nice day. I went down the hiking path alone as I did every year. It was maybe a three-hour trail, so I brought everything I needed, some snacks, a compass, water, my Walkman, and my walking stick. I went down the path with relatively no incident until I was maybe three-fourths of the way down. Most years I'd see the occasional deer or fox or such, but this time was different. It felt as if everything in the woods had cleared out, not even a bird chirping or crickets, just the occasional breeze from the trees. I was down a particularly steep part of the trail, heading down through the trees and winding the path, a little when I looked over and saw this bone pyramid. I shit you not it looked like someone had spent hours making sure it all stuck. On top was most likely a moose skull, but it was odd. All I can remember was the antlers were just weird, bent in an odd shape and the skull was just built wrong. It was too long and slender to be a normal moose. I saw this and began to move quicker. There was no debris or anything on the thing so I knew whoever or whatever did this was nearby. I moved quicker, not rushing, but I was unsettled nevertheless. Now before I go any further, let me just say my family is a firm believer in the creatures of the night, like Bigfoot, the Wendigo, Chupacabras. Now that that's out of the way, let me continue. I believe what I found was some sort of ritualistic belonging in the woods. As I continued on, I began hearing this sort of clicking sound, like someone clapping two sticks together. The more I walked towards the car, the more prominent it became. I started to get freaked out and by now I didn't keep my headphones in just in case I was being followed by something. The more I came down the path, the louder the clicking became when I saw the opening of the woods into the parking lot. I rushed over, glad to be near the safety of my car. I rushed out and threw my stuff in the car, never looking back as the clicking remained from the tree line. When I started my car I looked up and saw this odd looking silhouette of a man but its figure was just wrong. It was lumpy, with a large pot of flesh on its arm from what I could see. The more I looked closer, the more fleshy it became. It didn't have eyes, I can remember that. I don't remember how long I stared at it, but it was probably only a few seconds before the shock wore off. I threw my car into drive when I saw its jaw unhinge. 
It reminded Mai of an ant eating something, or like a predator mouth from that one movie as it made the same clicking sound I heard earlier. Before I could think my foot hit the gas and I was on my way home. I know it isn't the most dramatic ending, but it was something that made me realize that the woods aren't always a wonderful, safe place. And it's the reason why I never travel alone. I'm happy to share more stories if people are still interested. I know it's a lot to ask for, but I'm happy that by telling people some of these stories people are interested in this topic, I'll tune in later and see if I should tell more stories. If anyone has any questions about these things, I'll be happy to answer your questions. During one summer I got my first job at a nearby Dairy Queen in town. I met a couple of my friends from there, especially this one girl from Amber. Amber was the type of girl that never really grew out of her horse girl phase, but instead adapted to the outdoorsy lifestyle. I was 16 at the time and she was 20. She told me how she came from South Dakota and wanted to live out in the country and discovered our small town and loved it. She went to the college campus nearby, a few towns over in Amber, and I became great friends despite the age difference. During one winter Amber decided to let me stay the night out at her dorm. My grandparents were in Missouri at this time so it was easy to stay. And before you think what you're usually going to think she had a boyfriend and I was interested in another girl from my school. I was lying on Amber's bed, watching her play on her Xbox when Amber's roommate Kaitlin came into the room. Kaitlin immediately asked if she could take her to McDonald's since by now the buses around town had shut down and since she didn't have a car. After some negotiations, Amber finally agreed, and I hopped down to go join them. We drove down into town at that time, it was around 2 in the morning. I'm not gonna lie, I was on some stuff when we went out, so before we pulled into the parking lot in McDonald's, I got out my eye drops and let them go inside before me. I hung back as the two entered McDonald's, we would have gone into the drive through during this time. The building was undergoing reconstruction, so the drive through area was closed. I finished up the eye drops and got out of the car when suddenly I blinked and I was back in the dorm. I'm looking down, watching Amber playing Halo on her Xbox when I was filled with shock. I tried to chalk it up to me being tired and imagining things when all of a sudden Kaitlyn walked in again. The entire ordeal played out again, Kaitlyn nagging Amber to go to McDonald's which went on for a minute before Amber agreed. Amber then walked up to me and asked if I wanted to come with her. Me, being weirded out of my mind, said no. I don't know what happened, maybe it was a brain F up or something, and this isn't particularly scary, but it's definitely something that has messed with my head. Another story I have is from my cousin that lives in Maine. Every once in a while, either my grandparents would go visit my aunt and uncle in Maine with my cousin Mike. Mike was a few years older than I was and grew up also in a remote town up in northern Maine. This story is from when my cousin graduated high school, and for his vacation before starting college, he decided to go on the 100-mile hike with his girlfriend Sam and his friend Aaron with his girlfriend Piper. The four were all outdoorsy people where they all agreed to pack their gear and head out. They packed two weeks' worth of supplies in their backpack, had a friend drive them to the head of the trail, and drop them off. The first few days in the woods were relatively uneventful, although having encounters with a fox on their second night. On the fifth day, Piper begins telling the group that she's been hearing footsteps walking around the campsite during the night when everyone was asleep. She assumed it was one of us until we told her in the morning we had all slept through the night. We originally played it off as a raccoon or bear or something when we found a human footprint in the mud. Or at least that's what they thought. A bit uneasy, the four of them quickly packed up and headed off, Another night went by uneventfully. On the seventh night, when they were just getting ready to stop walking and set up camp, Mike saw a weird creature lying on the ground. The body was half decomposed with maggots squirming around it. Its skull and part of its chest was exposed. Its skull was almost like an elephant skull if you've ever seen one. Elephant skulls have a large hole in the center to make it look like a cyclops when all the flesh is eaten away. Mike tried to write it off as a moose with a facial deformity when Aaron noticed that all the legs were missing except one, which had almost like a human foot. Upon further inspection, 
It looked as though a large human foot had been burned on as a replacement for a hoof or whatever was originally there. The group decides to head a little further during the darkness and to not talk about it for the rest of the trip to not scare them. By now Sam was shaking in fear and wanted to leave right away. Mike and the others set up camp a few miles away on a ridge overlooking a relatively small lake surrounded by wilderness. Sam and Piper were having trouble sleeping so Mike and Aaron took shifts staying up to watch the campsite and keep the campfire lit while they slept, which seemed to ease them. Around what most likely was 3-4 in the morning Aaron was on watch when he hears a twig snap in the woods. Aaron looks up and sees this huge humanoid figure just standing in a nearby clearing, maybe 200 feet away. Aaron woke Mike up to look at the creature, and as soon as Mike wakes up the yellow eyes appear on the creature and darts off back into the woods. Mike and Aaron stayed up until the sun rose, hearing weird grunting sounds coming from the woods every couple of minutes or so. Aaron is convinced that it's Bigfoot while Mike believes it's someone messing with him. But it wouldn't make sense, they're still around 30 miles from the end of the journey, and it wouldn't make sense for someone to just wait out there just to F with someone. The moment the sun rose the group packed up, Mike and Aaron both agreed to not say anything to not scare the girls. The next night was relatively uneventful as they all decided that they would finish the trail by the next day. That morning they wake up to find that the same dead animal carcass they had seen days prior had been laying on the path forward where the end of the trail would be. The group understandably freaked the F out, decide to jog most of the way back. After walking a while, the group is tired and Piper says she's going to go take a leak further in the woods. The group gets out some food for lunch when Piper comes rushing back. She has a shocked expression on her face. We ask her what's wrong when she explains for us to come see with ourselves. Our stuff is all out so we decide to leave our stuff behind to go look. Stupid, I know. But they head off just over a small ridge and find this deer carcass literally turned inside out. It literally looked as if someone took a small slit into the deer and used an ungodly force to flip the deer inside out, to have all the organs spill out like a meat slushy. Sam immediately throws up from the smell as the rest of the group look in shock. The group immediately heads back to find in the minute or two they were gone their stuff had been raided through. Mike decided that this was enough and that they were getting out of there tonight. Mike packed up what was left since a lot of their food was gone and got the group to head on forward. The group reached the end of the trail when a forest ranger immediately greeted them. The forest ranger said that the trail was closed for the time being since they had found some hazards. The group went home as Aaron did some research. Apparently a dead body was found in a creek a few miles. Let's just say that most of the others aren't that big of long distance camping anymore. Aaron recently tried looking up the original news report though but was unable to find the article. Sometimes things are covered up because if people knew that shit, I don't think anyone would ever do another journey like that. Growing up in a small town is a strange ordeal. Everyone seems to know each other very well, and the only new people we get are people on long road trips or family coming to visit us. Like I said, I live in a very small town, yet I love it. Towards the west end of town, we have some farms growing. Although most are cattle farms, there are the occasional place where they grow corn, wheat, whatever they can really. There's this old farmhouse that had been abandoned since the 1970s after a supposed murder that happened there. Although it's most likely that the family moved out, and that's what rumors spread. Anyway, when I was little, my cousin Mike and a few of my friends would come over, and we'd hop on our bikes. I remember this was a special occasion since Mike was there. This is the reason we went over there. Mike was the leader of our small gang when he was around and everybody listened no question. We went down the dirt path and Mike stopped the bike. It was around noon when Mike spotted the farmhouse and I swear to God I can still remember the smug look growing across his face as an idea popped into his head. Mike told us that we were playing hide and seek in the house since we didn't have much of anything else to do. James and I reluctantly agreed. We were around 8-9 at the time, so we didn't have any judgment against adventure quite at that age. The drew straws and eventually, I was the one that originally had to seek. 
I sighed and began to count to 90 as I knew they both ran to the farmhouse. 90 seconds passed as I opened my eyes. I smiled as I saw the door wide open to the farmhouse. Those idiots had forgotten to shut it. I thought to myself as I jogged towards the house. I reached the front stoop, heading inside. I remember the boards were so old, I thought every step I took the floor would collapse. I headed inside, seeing the house on the inside. To the right was a staircase while to the left lead to a living room. Straight ahead lead to a hallway to the kitchen then towards the back door. I smirked, knowing Mike and James enough to know they'd hide together in the same place. I looked forward as a creak came from down the hallway. I saw the basement door slowly moving in the wind. I smirked, knowing that they were leaving breadcrumbs for me to find. The basement was dark. I didn't even try searching for a light since I knew it definitely wouldn't have any power. Downstairs I heard a dripping sound. It was like a sink had been left on slightly as the water slowly drained out. I stopped at the bottom of the stairs, holding my breath, listening for any breathing. It was dark, I could barely see five feet in front of me, and the only light down there came from the upstairs. The concrete basement was cold, in fact, the entire basement was entirely cold from what I remember. I began feeling a large anxiety from the basement that I couldn't explain. I listened in and heard a soft breathing noise. By then I knew someone had been hiding down there and I was going to find them. I called out to them, telling them I knew they were there and I was going to find them. I started walking towards the breathing, avoiding anything lying around in the basement. I bumped into a piano and accidentally set off a few keys, which scared the shit out of me. Keep this in mind because this will come up later. I reached the back wall, the breathing having gotten louder. I moved to my right, hearing the breathing louder. The breathing felt warmer as I got closer. I reached out to touch them, calling out to the person when the breathing just suddenly stopped. I didn't hear movement or anything, but I continued moving. I reached the end of the wall, finding nothing. I felt odd when suddenly the piano began playing softly. At first I thought it was just in my head my mind playing tricks on me. I focused in as the music began playing more violently. By now I knew that this wasn't normal and I began moving back towards the stairs in a panic when the breathing returned, a hot breath on the back of my neck. I screamed as a hand gripped my shoulder, squeezing it softly as I ran. The hand let go as I heard a large crash behind me, like a moose slamming through objects to get to a destination. My legs felt like jello and my eyes began to water as I climbed up the stairs and burst outside. I laid on the ground, sobbing as Mike and James walked over, asking where I had been. I was confused. I was downstairs for only around five minutes, but they told me I had been missing for four hours. I was confused when they told me they had been looking for me for three hours, but never checked the basement. When I asked why they told me that the door had been locked from the inside, and when they asked if anyone was in there, all that returned was silence. These are just some stories that are from my childhood and such. These were originally three different posts, but they were deleted. I'll be happy to tell more stories if people are interested. In July 1976, my wife and two children ages 12 and 7 and I moved across the Oregon Cascade mountain range from Corvallis, Oregon to Sisters, Oregon. At the time, Sisters was a small mountain range. I was so naive as to forest management, I didn't know there were designated areas to get firewood. During a Saturday in late October, we were running low on kindling, so we decided to go south as Sisters about 12 miles alongside the road where there was a large growth of two to three inch diameter trees with many blow downs on the ground. We figured they would be easy to collect and sew up and load into our vehicle trunks. The morning was chilly high 20s low 30s so about 8 a.m. we bundled the kids and ourselves and headed out in our two-car caravan. Arriving at our spot we pulled off the road and got busy. The only tool I had was a small bow saw. While my family gathered the poles, I began sawing. We quickly loaded my wife's trunk, and she took the kids and headed back to town. Once they were gone, I started sawing wood to load in my car. 
but after a couple of minutes, every hair in my neck, arms, and spine stood up I could. I felt I was in danger and that I should leave. There was no mind speak, just an intense feeling that I was in danger and needed to leave. I also knew something had eyes on me. I immediately stood up as my gaze was drawn to a downed tree about 40 feet away. It had snapped about four feet off the ground and been there a while as weeds and branches were obscuring any sight underneath the tree. I studied that tree briefly looking for something out of place, but I saw nothing and then slowly did a full 180 turn looking for any sign of any indication of an animal in the vicinity. I saw nothing. I later learned I should have looked up into the trees, but it never occurred to me then I tried to forgive myself for an overactive imagination. So I knelt back down and I got back to work. Almost immediately the hair again stood up and those feelings and thoughts came back. So I repeated the slow turn looking for signs something was out of place nothing again. I studied the down tree to see if I could see anything behind it. There was nothing there. I brushed it off as imagination. I said out loud to myself if anyone or anything else it there. Then alright I got the message. I'm leaving. It took me two trips to get all the wood and my saw to the car. Once loaded, I went to the driver's side door, took one last look around, started the car and left. I never saw, heard, or smelled anything unusual or out of place. The following Monday, when I went to get the kids from the babysitter, I must have said something to her. Her husband is part of Native American and at the time was a heavy equipment operator for the Forest Service. Three days later, when I went to collect the kids, Bill was home. I'll call him Bill, it's not his real name. He was known for being a straight shooter. I stopped at the picnic table and said hi, and he said to get some iced tea or coffee and come back to talk to him. When I returned, he immediately asked me to tell him what happened the Saturday before. As I told him, he asked if I knew what it was that bothered me. I told him I didn't know. I figured it must probably it was a cougar, a bobcat, or a bear. He smiled. He asked, Did you check the trees above you? I shook my head no. You should have. Then Bill said something about on an apex predator giving a warning before attacking. I thought for a minute and replied, So what do you think it was then? He asked. Could it have been a Bigfoot? I thought he was joking, so I laughed and said something to effect that I believe they could be real but that they were probably myths or folk tales. For the next hour plus, he related his personal experiences with the people of the forest. Here is one of his stories. Bill was on a job site in Washington State using a D8 cat. He was on the side of the mountain when he stopped for lunch. Where he stopped, there was a 600 to 700 foot cliff drop off on his right. He sat on the edge of the cat with his legs dangling over the track to eat and enjoy the scenery of the valley below. As he took a bite of his second sandwich, he heard a faint noise behind him, but on the other side of the cat. He turned to look and to his surprise his face was about 18 inches away from a huge sabe that was leaning on the track looking at him with a faint smile on its face. He said he knew he was in no danger and he felt no fear. For some reason that morning he had asked the place he was staying at to pack an extra sandwich for his lunch. He slowly reached into his lunchbox, grabbed the sandwich, unwrapped it, and held it out to his new friend. The Sabe took it, ate it in one bite, pushed off the track, gave a slight grunt, and turned and walked up into the woods, giving him one last look. After hearing all his encounters, I left their house that night a firm believer in the forest people. I was on my golf cart by myself, and it was completely dark outside and quiet. I live in a neighborhood surrounded by farmland in rural Michigan and woods throughout various spots. I was driving but pulled over because this giant beetle was on my shirt. It pinched me and freaked me out. I pulled over next to a stretch of woods and struggled to get it off of me. In the woods nearby I heard walking, like perhaps a deer walking around, so I wasn't scared. Yet, the sounds got louder and closer. The walking had gotten so loud it sounded unreal, something out of Jurassic Park like a dinosaur stomping. The walking had gotten overwhelmingly loud and extremely close, so I slammed on the gas and hurry out of there. 
I looked behind me but couldn't see anything, but felt shivers down my spine because I swear it was inches behind me. Not sure if this has anything to do with it, but I was talking about skinwalkers with my sister and doing some research, so I hope that didn't invite anything. But I can't even describe how loud the stomping was. It sounded unreal and was seriously terrifying. I wasn't too sure what it could have been, but many people are saying it was probably a Wendigo, and I do believe this is, they can get up to 15 feet tall, which would explain why the stomping was very loud perhaps. Good evening, fellow enthusiasts. Let me start by validating my credibility first. I've been monitoring the crypt side for a good 15 years now, have a degree in zoology, and a master's focusing specifically on herpetology study of reptiles and amphibians for the newcomer. This academic background has greatly contributed to my pursuit of the known and the unknown. What I'm about to share is a living testament to my adventures in the dark corners of our world. And before I roll the dice on this, know that this is not some drunken tall tale. During the event, I was unadulteratedly sober, senses sharpened by the austere seaside chill. Yesterday, I had a harrowing encounter, the likes of which I've never encountered in my generous stretch of experiences facing the elusive nag's head beach creature. The moon was in complete authority, stars stubbornly shrouded behind the thick shroud of clouds. As the tide surreptitiously slid in, I saw, or rather sensed something, a mere flicker at the corner of my vision, something that required peripheral acknowledgement, a fleeting shadow, a passing chill, an abrupt indent in reality. This being the nag's head beach creature, much like many obscure curiosities we study, appreciates the solitude of night. Nocturnal engagements are its preferred encounters, lingering in the periphery, solidifying its ghostly essence. A mystery etched in the sands of Nag's head, always visible from the sides, yet vanishing to thin air the moment direct contact is attempted. Illusory, you might say, but not when you've heard it the sound that threads chills through your spine. The creature in its movements spoke a peculiar language, an alien-like slithering rustle, a chicka chicka, if you will. An uncanny sound clawing up your consciousness, it was akin to the whispers of nighttime wind through desolate dunes, or the uneasy scuttle of a crustacean against washed-up seashells, a serpentine orchestra only the nocturne listens to. Now about its tracking signature footprints you wouldn't expect. They were digital, formed of an enigmatic static that pulsed before disappearing into the soothing waves. Ghostly lit specters on the sand left behind by its passing, as if the beach obliquely hummed with the static discharge of this creature. A modern mystery misaligned from anything we perceive as typical. And God forbid, should you strive to photograph this elusive entity, for it would defy the said attempt in an uncannily digital way again, rendering itself only a three-pixel smudge in any photo. An undefined form, yet mysteriously defined by its defiant resistance to be perceived. After the encounter, my mind whirled with theories and speculations this creature's nature, its ethereal presence, and its disembodied essence felt otherworldly. Pondering my experience, the possible explanation that eventually crystallized was dubiously paranormal. I believe that what I encountered was not a creature bound to the three dimensions we live in. It might be our first contact with a creature of the fourth dimension. The digital footprints, the confounding three-pixel apparition, and the ephemeral perceptibility all lead to an elusive creature that exists in a higher order of spatial existence, only partially interfacing with our three-dimensional space-time reality, a being transparent to us, living a parallel life wrapped in the splintering silence of the nag's head night. This is our world, the crypt side. A melting pot of varied realities, countless oddities, and incomprehensible encounters. This was my encounter with the elusive nag's head beach creature, an experience that tipped my skeptically academic life to a pondering, fear-churning paranoia. But isn't that why we're here? To chase the unknown and expose the veiled truths? Because in the end, isn't that the very soul of cryptozoology? Stay curious, stay brave, and keep your mind open.
I was a part of Navy SEAL team for as long as I remember. Still, when it comes to my crazy missions, I have one to share. So the mission had taken us deep into the hostile territory, where danger lurked in every shadow. Our objective was clear. Rescue a kidnapped scientist from an abandoned facility with a grim history. Little did we know, the labyrinthine corridors of this place held not only human threats, but a supernatural presence eager to ensnare us in its dark clutches. As we navigated through the decrepit halls, the air thick with tension, the stench of abandonment clung to every corner. Our footsteps echoed through the desolate facility, a haunting symphony of our uncertainty. The scientist's life depended on our success, but something far more sinister awaited us in the depths. It was in the bowels of this forsaken facility that we encountered the unknown predator. About seven feet tall, its muscular frame and large head with long, wild hair gave it an otherworldly appearance. Yellow eyes, almost glowing in the dark, stared at us with an unsettling curiosity. It stood there, unmoving as if assessing us. We cautiously continued our mission, keeping a watchful eye on the mysterious creature. It didn't seem aggressive, but an eerie tension hung in the air. Then, without warning, it attacked. The battle erupted in chaos, the creature moving with an uncanny speed and strength. Its sharp teeth flashed in the dim light as it lunged at us, catching us off guard. Our training kicked in, and we fought fiercely for our lives against this supernatural adversary. Bullets pierced the air, and the creature's roars echoed through the labyrinth. It was a battle of survival against both the paranormal and the physical, each member of the team pushing themselves to the limits. In the end, we managed to overcome the creature, but the victory was short-lived. As we called for extraction, our relief turned to dread. Through the facility's shattered windows, we saw an approaching enemy army, their silhouettes dark against the moonlit horizon. There was no time to celebrate our triumph over the thing. A greater threat loomed. Swiftly, we made the decision to retreat, leaving the haunted facility behind. We slipped away into the night, shadows merging with shadows, and the encounter with the unknown predator became a secret etched into the memories of the silent warriors. We never spoke of it again, and the story of that night remained buried in the classified pages of our missions, a chilling chapter in the unsung stories of the Navy SEALs. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.